present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we begin, Mr. Corum has asked for a moment of personal privilege. Mr. Corum. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeffrey Corum, Precinct 7. Although you may feel you have spent too much time in this room recently, I want to invite you back this weekend for the RMHS Drama Club production of Don't Touch That Dial. I can pretty much guarantee it will feel like a different place here as the students enact the 1930s era radio dramas, an episode of The Adventures of Superman, and a recreation of Orson Welles' original version of The War of the Worlds. Shows are Friday and Saturday nights at 7.30 and Sunday matinee at 2. The box office opens one hour before each show. Thank you. Okay, next, how we will proceed tonight. There has been a request since the, uh, the speakers are here tonight that we take Articles 21, 22, and 23 out of order. They are all related, so I will allow discussion on all three at the same time, but we will vote on them separately. So we begin with a uh, uh, motion by Ms. Ms. Alvarado to take Articles 21, 22, and 23 out of order and then vote it on consecutively. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 1, Mr. LaLasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for the three articles, I think I'll need more than 10 minutes. Okay. Um, first, let me explain to town meeting why these articles are related, and, and some more than others. Articles 21 and 23 are, if you will, very similar parcels, so I think it's going to be helpful for you to see the discussion on 23 and 21, and not just 21 by itself. Articles 22 and 23 are owned by the same seller, and there's a contingency on one depending on what happens with the other, so those are very closely related. So I think by and large, um, and, and the sellers in the room, um, you, you will benefit from having a discussion of all three. Um, to, to start, uh, the Select Board has met twice recently in executive session to discuss all three of these articles. Um, the information discussed in the minutes of those meetings are not yet public. Um, they would be public if, if town meeting disposes of these articles at this town meeting. Um, the first article you can see behind me is Timberneck Swamp, right in the middle. Um, all the land around it in green is owned by the town. Um, it's important to note that to the uh, right-hand side of Charles Street is owned by conservation, but uh, the other is Charles Street Cemetery. So the parcel itself is 100% surrounded by conservation land. <clears throat> As you can see on the slide, it's owned by Don Pica. Um, he's actually a Wakefield resident, currently in Florida, back in a few weeks. It's about almost 13 acres, and it is very wet. does allow bow hunting. Um, some members of town meeting may recall we had an article uh, with some reports of gunfire years ago in this parcel and thus town meeting passed a bylaw to prevent gunfire from happening out there in case it was. Um, the conservation administrator has walked this parcel. He has brought some members with him, um, not in any formal way, but they have strong interest in uh, the town acquiring this parcel. If the owner wished to donate the land, the owner could have donated it directly to CONSCOM and we'd be finished. The, uh, the owner did not wish to donate the land, so this is the process used to go through town meeting. Um, the assessed value has wandered between fifteen dollars and $20,000, again, for 13 acres. Um, so the offer price um, that I offered on behalf of the selectman who authorized me was $25,000. The uh, source of funds to be from the sale of real estate fund, and I'll come back to that discussion. If town meeting authorizes the select board to purchase the parcel, um, they will first engage in a purchase and sale contract with the seller, and then they will secondly engage CONSCOM in a process, and I'm going to circle back to this with the other two articles in addition, um, so that CONSCOM should end up with this parcel. There's just no question about that. I'm going to note at this point before I get to 22 and 23, the town did not do an independent appraisal of this land, and I'll, I'll tell you why. 
this, this very busy map is uh, Simon's Way, and the Burbank Ice Arena is right at the center in gray. The important things to take away from this is that the town owns land in green right around the skating rink, uh, but to the north and then separately to the south as conservation land. It's also wet. The subject matter of Article 22. This piece right there. That piece right there is Article 22, the one that has more value. And that one up behind the outfield um, is Article 23. Again, the same sellers. So the neighbors, in addition to town and conservation, is residential to the left-hand side, to the uh, west. To the uh, east, it's the Reading Rifle and Revolver Club. And behind Parcel Way up in the north, it's also Camp Curtis. Both of uh, these parcels, Articles 22 and Article 23, are owned by the Zani family. There's about 14 acres in that southern parcel. Some of it's buildable, some of it is not, some of it is wet. Um, through an RFP process, which I'll describe shortly, uh, they offered the land to the town at $750,000. We have an independent appraisal that includes an easement of a million three, and I'm, I'm going to also come back to that. <clears throat> that more northern parcel was a straight negotiation with the Zani family. Again, having gone through executive session with the select board, um, there's about 10 acres. It's virtually all wet. We offered $25,000 for that parcel. Uh, they have ac accepted that contingent on town meeting agreeing to the 750000 We did do an independent appraisal on that one at the same time we did the other parcel, and that came in as $10,000 as is. <clears throat> I did not engage an independent appraiser for that other small parcel because, quite honestly, the cost of the appraisal it would have had an, an answer very similar to Article 23 in the $10,000 neighborhood, you know, perhaps a little bit more. Um, just to give you a little more background, I first met with the Zani family a few years ago, and their priority was to first dispose of land in the Eaton Lakeview area. For those that don't know the family, they've, they've been here for generations. They've worked very well with the town. They actually built a lot of Route 128 in this part of, uh, the, of the Massachusetts. Um, they've worked really closely with the town and many DPW and other related projects for years. And if you will, they're winding up some of their estate at this point. Um, last fall, they approached us with the Eaton Lakeview um, project having almost been agreed to and certainly winding down. They wanted to proceed with these two parcels. Um, they approached the select board in a meeting over the winter, and they asked for an easement. If I go into too much detail here, you'll all run out of the room screaming. But the federal government took a lot of land around where the skating rink is now in the 1950s, part of the Cold War, and located a missile site. They then returned the land to those that wanted it. Most owners did not want it, so they, gave, they, they sold it to the town. The Zani family did want it. A really critical piece of information right there. There's a tiny little strip that is, that is owned by the town, not by the Zanis, but it gives full access to the Zani property. Um, perhaps it was an error by the federal government, one can't be sure, but the end legal result is their parcel is only worth a million three with that easement, and it's worth 76000 on an appraised basis without it. So naturally they came to the select board in the winter and said, we'd like to go to town meeting and ask for that easement. Um, after a discussion um, at that night, they agreed to come meet with myself, two members of their family, two members of the select board, each with attorneys, and through, through town council's advice, um, the correct process was to stop discussing it, to, to stop trying to negotiate an outcome, and for the town to actually publish an RFP formally and ask for someone to offer us land that met certain criteria. There wasn't a lot of people that could do that, certainly. Um, but this parcel was not unique. The other two parcels, in addition to having a lower value, uh, one could say is unique. We own the land all around it. Um, so that once the Zani family 
agreed to take that path, we had to stop discussing it with them. There's some things we perhaps would have liked to have done, and I'll come back to that later, but at that point we finished having any kind of a formal discussion with them until they responded to the RFP. And again, the board has met then in executive session since that. <coughs> I'm going to talk a little about the independent appraiser that we hired two years ago. Um, J.F. Ryan Associates is the name. And for the next two slides, what I am going to say is things that this appraiser said, they're not my words. Um, he's a certified appraiser. Somehow his number is 1234, which was interesting. Um, he walked the site extensively, uh, again, two years ago, met with the owners, and did a lot of background work about how the land was used and whether there should be some concern as to what it was used and what the town might want to do. Um, his full report has been on the website for several weeks. Um, this 14-acre parcel, again, he judged to be worth one of two things. It's either $76,000 without the easement or a million three with the easement. Interesting parcel. He also commented that most of this um, parcel in Article 22 is in what's called Flood Zone X. Um, that was typically between a 100 and a 500 year flood, which happens to be happening a little more often, it seems. Uh, it slopes away from Range Road. So again, right next to the skating rink, uh, right where that blue line is, there's a, a private road. It slopes away as you go to the south. It slopes downhill. Buildable land, if you will, is close to the road. The wetland is as it slopes away. You'll see another map shortly. Uh, he said, overall, this is a very attractive parcel for potential residential development. He went on to say that uh, probably, uh, probable and legally possible in an S40, which is one acre zoning, which is what this is, that a subdivision uh, pursuant uh, to ANR or approval not required uh, would allow four single-family houses to be built. So his conclusion was the best use for this development is for single-family homes. Um, that does not remove the possibility of doing more dense housing, certainly. He conducted his valuation based, again, two years ago, of four vacant single-family sites, but one acre. There's not a lot of one-acre parcels in Reading uh, being worth about 550000 each. And then he took away some, some costs and came up with a value of approximately 1.3 million net. The next uh, map I'm going to show you was done by this fellow, uh, Greg Hotchmuth, um, a professional wetland scientist. You can see his credentials up there. Um, he's on the board of directors for the MACC, and he's a member of the Town of Merrimack's Conservation Committee. And he works with a firm that we work with in Middleton. I know this map will be impossible to really see the details, but the most important thing is you can see the gray road just south of the ice arena. Below that, you see two different green shaded pieces. Um, one is buildable, one is wet. That's the simplest answer I can give you. Um, he actually says there is slightly more wetlands than what our GIS layer and, and our conservation administrator have said. That will have to be determined because as I mentioned, once we went into a legal process, this work was done by the seller. We could not access the parcel since the, the process was not to buy this land, it was to ask for land to be offered. So during the four to six week period, we had no legal right to go on the land and do any work. Um, but this uh, credentialed wetland scientist has said there is more than four acres that is buildable, that is dry. There's um, you know, the balance of it, almost 10 acres that is wetlands. On this parcel, if town meeting authorizes the select board to uh, purchase the parcel, um, they'll then have to engage in a public process and a member of the select board is going to stand up after me and explain that in a little more detail. Um, but clearly there is two different types of the, of the big parcel. There's um, one that should absolutely involve CONSCOM, same as the prior article I described and the next one. And the other that has been discussed for recreation and athletics, um, field space being at a premium in this town, uh, that would be a first use that you'd want to explore, certainly. Um, and you know, one of the objectives would be to avoid a dense residential housing project in that area. 
Um, the results of any public process, almost for certain, unless it's just leave it alone, is going to have to come back to this body for some kind of funding authorization. Whether it's a study or whether it's actual construction, town meeting will have the last say. The source of funds through, through this uh, RFP process, and again as voted by the select board in executive session, would be the majority from the sale of real estate fund, 550000 and the remainder from something called the Reading Ice Arena account. Um, today, the sale real estate fund has a balance of about 620000 If all three articles are approved by town meeting, that balance will shrink to $20,000. you will be spending 600000 the ICE Arena account has 435000 in it. This would ask to use 200 of that. The balance remaining would be 235. Town meeting is a little more familiar with the sale of real estate fund. It can only be used for three purposes, this being one of the three. Um, many years ago when we sold the uh, landfill, uh, the finance committee at the time had a proposal and plan to spend the proceeds down over 10 years to fund capital, which we did. Since then, even though the sale of real estate fund has been replenished a couple of times, we've had no use for this money. We've not asked it to be used. But again, it can be used for a very limited amount of things, this being one. The Reading Ice Arena account is money that has come in from the Ice Arena Authority that has not been appropriated through the budget process. So there was a time when, again, we used an annual appropriation from the Ice Arena to fund something like capital. A um, number of years ago, FinCom, on a year when they could not afford to pay us any, looked at the contract and saw the guarantee was zero, so we shouldn't be assuming this revenue in our budget. So since that time, the 435000 that's in the account has come from an annual contribution, if you will, or earnings of the Ice Arena Authority. Article 23 is that parcel a little bit to the north and behind the baseball field or soccer field. Um, again, it's surrounded by conservation to the uh, northwest, uh, townland to the uh, southwest, Camp Curtis to the direct east, and then the gun club to the south. This was appraised again at approximately $10,000. Uh, again, the conservation administrator has walked this parcel. I don't know if CONSCOM members have joined him, but expressed strong interest on behalf of CONSCOM in adding this, much like the first article that we discussed tonight, and one would presume the wet part of the second article. So again, if town meeting authorizes the select board to purchase this parcel, they'll have a discussion with CONSCOM. Um, I've mentioned this now three times. There's three parcels that they want to have a discussion with CONSCOM. Um, but there are, are other parcels. Um, then th those discussions have only happened at the staff level, so I'd rather not identify them. Um, but there are other parcels that conservation um, you know, could be wanting to acquire or perhaps swap with the town uh, for certain reasons. And the conservation administrator and, cons and CONSCOM historically has been a very good partner in those discussions. Um, unlike this Timberneck Swamp parcel, um, I think that'll most likely remain as is certainly up to CONSCOM. Um, we believe that this uh, piece in the uh, outfield, as it were, um, would be an excellent place to put in trails. Uh, it's very wet, so some of them would absolutely have to be boardwalk, but there's a whole uh, possibility of trail linkage in this area for passive recreation that we think would be um, quite appropriate. So to the extent that there might be future spending on this, it could be to build some trails, but there are grants for that. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers the Northern Area Greenway. You'd have to have been in town meeting for at least 15 years for that. But there are occasions where there are funds available. And again, um, I'll wrap up by saying this $25,000 purchase price is contingent on town meeting agreeing to pay the $750,000 uh, on that Article 22. At this point, I'd like to ask Vanessa Alvarado to speak on this. Ms. Alvarado? Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you to the town manager for providing the background and purpose for this article. Uh, I also have to give my thanks to John Halsey, who so kindly volunteered me to speak on this article. So I have the honor of addressing the elephant in the room. Looks something like this. All right. It's too good of an opportunity. I couldn't pass it up. All right. So 
I know the first question on the front of your mind is, what are we going to do with the land? The truth is, we don't know yet. Uh, in order to decide how to use it, we would need significant community involvement, including surveys, community meetings, and discussions with various town departments, organizations, board committees and commissions, including recreation, athletics, uh, various town departments, um, schools, council on aging, and most importantly, the conservation committee. Um, they would be a key partner in this discussion. However, um, this acquisition was proposed so close to town meeting that we haven't had the opportunity to take those necessary steps. What we're hoping to do today is purchase an option for tomorrow. So as you think about this article, I would ask that you set aside all the amazing, brilliant, exciting ideas you have for this land and instead focus squarely on the acquisition aspect of it. There will be plenty of time in the future to discuss all the possibilities. All right. For those of you new to town meeting, Reading simply does not have developable land. Reading is essentially 100% developed. Um, what you see under development now is actually being redeveloped and is in the hands of private owners. Um, so as we talk about the future needs of the town, we don't have much land to work with. We're, lock we're landlocked. The opportunity to purchase land is such a rare occurrence in town that we didn't want to potentially miss this opportunity while we went through the lengthy process of deciding its future. It's also worth noting that if Reading owns it, the future possibilities will be under the town's control. While today that land is not technically worth a lot of money, we don't know what the future may hold. Demand land near urban areas continues to grow, and Reading, as you all know, is popular because of the proximity to two major highways, as well as Boston, Lawrence, and Lowell, all major employment areas. Should town meeting vote to acquire this land, it should be noted that any development of this property by the town would require funding. Therefore, it would need to come before, your, um, before you for approval. All future actions on this land would come before town meeting again. The previous select board had had the opportunity to discuss various scenarios involving whether or not um, this land is acquired by the town. It might be helpful if we walk through some of those now. All right. What happens if town meeting votes yes tonight on this article? Step one, as Bob mentioned, we would need to complete the purchase and sale agreement. Following the close of that, the select board would take um, the next steps of creating a strategy for how to move this discussion forward. This would be an involved process, as I mentioned, and would likely include an ad hoc committee of staff, residents, and elected officials. This is something we would want to be very thoughtful about. All right. What happens if town meeting votes no tonight? Possibly the property owners could come before town meeting in November um, to request an easement. An easement is a right to cross or otherwise use someone else's land for a specified purpose. In this case, it would be a right for the property owners to access a portion of town-owned road that is not currently considered public. This access, as Bob mentioned, would significantly increase the value and attractiveness of the land to developers. According to an appraisal completed two years ago, the value of the land with the easement is about $1.3 According to town council, the easement would, not be, would need to be sold to the property owners, although the value of that easement has not yet been determined. If they asked for an easement, town meeting would need to vote yes or no. So now we're at November town meeting. The property owners have asked for an easement. Not sure what happened there. OK. Um, in November, if town meeting voted to grant the easement, the property owners would likely sell the land to a developer. Now, the reason I say a developer is because I'd be hard pressed um, for there to be another buyer to buy 14 acres of undeveloped land at that cost. Here is where the possibilities start to get a little bit complicated and hard to predict, but I'll give you a few potential scenarios that the board has discussed previously. Scenario one, the land is currently zoned for four single family homes and that is what is built by a developer. Scenario two, a developer could choose to put in a large scale development. Now we have reached the 10% threshold of affordable housing and we therefore are exempt from additional 40Bs. Plus we have the one year safe haven. However, 
the inventory of affordable units is constantly fluctuating, as the assistant town manager described last week. We must also keep in mind that the 2020 census will change our minimum threshold, and we don't know if we'll still be within the 10%. The 10% number is something all towns are constantly chasing. So while a developer may not be able to put in dense housing at the moment, that may very well uh, change in a couple of years. We just don't know. Scenario three. Developer makes an appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals to develop some other type of structure. This scenario has many different possibilities and is really beyond the ability to predict, but it's worth noting. All right. So what happens if town meeting votes against the easement? This puts us in an awkward situation. It essentially means the town does not want to buy the land, but we also wouldn't be allowing the owners to dispose of it in a meaningful way. A no vote could temporarily end the discussion unless the property owners find a way to appeal, choose to bring it to a town meeting again in the future, or pursue other actions. Those are the scenarios that the board had discussed previously. So, this is an incredibly rare opportunity for the town to acquire a large parcel of land with a tremendous amount of potential. Uh, I want to acknowledge that it can be unsettling to buy something when you don't have a predetermined use for it. However, as I mentioned, any future actions on this land would require extensive public input and town meeting approval. So ultimately, you will have the final say in what this land is used for. Uh, I hope this answers some of the questions you may have had walking in here tonight. We're happy to answer any other questions you may have, and I hope you will consider supporting this article. Thank you. Your FinCom report? Mr. Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I'll give the FinCom report on Articles 21, 22, and 23. Um, so at our meeting on April 29th, uh, the Finance Committee voted 5-0 to uh, recommend all three of these articles to town meeting. Is there further discussion? Yes. Mr. Ventura? Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, all that land behind uh, the, ice, the parcels we're talking about, have soil studies been done? Um, I hear, you know, government missile base, I'm thinking arsenic, whatever else is in the soil that could end up costing us uh, a lot more than just the acquisition. I love the idea of the acquisition. I just want to make sure all, we put all our eggs in the basket beforehand. Even the the sore station, you know, cost us 475,000 unknown, you know, where they found those contaminants. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It was when the ice arena was built. But that does not mean that every inch of the two parcels near the ice arena were started. But the general area was, and the buildable portions were. And again, the independent appraiser um, had extensive discussion with the property owner as to how they used it. Did they ever put trucks there? Were the trucks full of fuel? And so on and so forth. And there was no indication whatsoever. What they did was store concrete. Um, they had concrete curbing and other uh, road equipment there, but not, um, not tar. So. Absolutely anything is possible, and we will have to certainly look at that, but there's no, no indication whatsoever um, that there's a likelihood. Um, and I can tell you that um, down at uh, DPW Garage and even in the compost center, the answer is absolutely yes, there's, there is a likelihood. But this one, there's just no evidence, no past evidence, and no past study that's turned anything up. And then just one more thing. If I heard you right, there's additional wetlands that they're going to flag? that are unknown at this point? <coughs> or was it reduced? In, in, in this map here, the dark green section by this wetland scientist is delineated as wetlands. It's actually a larger area of wetlands than what is currently on our GIS map. Um, we have a line right here. He has it up there. Um, so conservation will have to be the final word on this, certainly. Um, we thought it was worthwhile that he took a very conservative approach to how much land is buildable, just over four acres. Um, conservation will have to be engaged before that final determination is made and anything is put on the buildable portion, certainly. Right, so the, the light green is the latest flags? Yes. The latest area. 
Yes. And I, I can't read the dimensions there. Do you, do you know them offhand? It just says upland area, 4.2 acres. It's irregular dimensions. Oh, no, I know it's irregular, but those I'm just thinking with a 100-foot buffer or something, is the space actually usable for us? Um, with 35-foot buff buffer, it absolutely whatever is. Whatever it is. With 100, you need a notice of intent in there. Yeah. And that discussion clearly has not happened. Right, we can file that. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Graham? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Russ Graham, Precinct 4. I wonder if I might, through you, ask the Finance Committee to share with us some of the dialogue that led to their recommendation. Thank you. That's you. <laughs> uh, some of the discussion we had tonight was the opportunity to be able to use sale of real estate fund. You know, we've sold some parcels in recent years and been able to put the money in there. So it's nice to be in a position where we're in a, where we can actually use those monies and get you know, some significant land. It's so rare in this town to be able to do that and to be in the driver's seat and have that land at less than assessed value was a value to us. Further discussion, yes. Mr. Herrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Um, Bob, you said there were only three things that we could use the sale of real estate funds for. What are the other two? You said capital is one, so we're missing one. What's the other one? Mr. Olasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Long-term obligations such as pensions. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Um, could you go, I think it's back one slide. You had a slide here which showed, uh, it was a higher level map that showed the, there it is right there. Uh, help me out. I believe the uh, house on the corner of the road that leads to the arena is that not a little treasure schoolhouse yes okay. well and that plot of land to the south let's say of little treasures well, who owns that piece of land I'm sorry I asked the last part of that question uh, the plot of land that's this side to the south of little treasures in other words one one down it's right. the only other uh, lot of land there that really has let's call it access to that buildable portion of our parcel. I'm just trying to understand how this all fits together. Do we know who owns that piece of land? Um, I guess I'm not, I'm going to answer your question indirectly. Um, okay. All the land um, fronting on Havel Street is all privately owned. Okay. Could, could one of those grant a right away uh, into this parcel? I think it would be compl complicated. Oh. But in theory, they could. Okay. So I'm just trying to understand that you're, you're jumping ahead of me. That's good. Uh, what I'm wondering is, would it be possible for a developer to purchase, and that's why I wanted to see this map, because it flashed by before, uh, would it be possible for a developer to purchase one of those art uh, pieces of land and simply, if they get it for the right price, knock down the house, buy the piece of land for $600,000? The math still works. If they can knock down the house, build their own access, and then go in there and build four houses. I, I, assume, that, I assume that would be uh, doable under the... Um, subdivision rules that the town has. Would there be anything we could do at that point? That, that would be out of the town's control, so long as they met the... What we're not sure about is whether the subdivision rules limit the depth of the property. Um, that would be up to CPDC. I don't know if they have a regulation that states that. Um, this is deeper than most subdivisions that I've seen, certainly. But it would, it would strike me that this is very doable. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. It seems if we say it's rare, people want it. <laughs> it's still swampland. <laughs> now, I have a quick question on Article 21, the uh, 10 acres up beyond center field of the Simons Field. Is there, can we 
have a conservation bridge that gets to the land that's arable, you don't show it on this map, but about 50% of this is FEMA flood zone. The other bit of it looks like you might develop a ball field out there, but it's landlocked. Can we get there somehow without violating law? Mr. Elijah. Um I've not walked out there, certainly. Um, if, if there were a lot of bats with me because there's mosquitoes, I might. My understanding is this parcel is not the least bit buildable. That is, a, that it is entirely wet. This is the one behind this, the baseball field. Yes. Yeah. yeah FEMA my understanding is 100% wet. Well, FEMA doesn't have a flood zone over part of it. Okay. Well, con conservation can certainly say differently and and say that you could extend the outfield in you know this portion if they wish, but that's not our assumption. We we can't make a bridge or something. Uh, with, yeah, with CONSCOM's permission, this is the area where I thought that boardwalks and, you know, connecting some trails, sort of passive recreation, if you will, would be a good idea. There's nothing there now. Okay. There are times of the year when this is not wet and people walk through it, absolutely. Hunters are out there. Yeah, I know. I, I walked the land over behind the uh, skating rink. First of all, thank you, Nelson Burbank, for taking it. We had an anti-missile site going in there. I don't know if you people know that. We killed that, and uh, Nelson stepped up and put a skating rink in there. Uh, about, about four acres of that land, of the, of the 17 acres, is, is arable. I walked the land. I was bitten by ticks. I didn't see any, I didn't see any snakes or anything. <laughs> the deer go over there. But I, I take issue with the appraiser talking about developing the land. Now, you can see the east end, you don't see all of it, but you can't do anything up at the east end. You might put a shuffleboard. But there's, there is land to make four sites. He said that it would take about $20,000 in land preparation. I take a big issue with that. On the west end, there's probably 60 hardwood trees. You know how much it takes down to 60 hardwood trees, even if you clear cut it? There's a hundred, couple hundred year old pines in the middle, and they're at different elevations. It's pretty hard to develop land. You have to make wells uh, cut and cut. Uh, there are mounds behind the skating rink that were pushed up that are size of a single size car garage. There's trees growing out of them. You know how much it would take to clear that out? Heavy equipment, believe me. There's two cars, well, what's left of two cars, often half in the water. There's many tons of dry, uh, dry uh, basins, slabs from the old anti-missile site. Been out there, what, 60, 70 years? And there's a lot of cement structures. To, just to move that is a big deal. And if you're going to make it a residential area, you're right beside the rifle range. I'd like to hear from someone that lives over in Haverhill Street if, if that's and bothersome. I think that thing is firing most of the year. I've been to baseball games over at Simons Field, and, and, and the guns are going off. Sunday and Saturday are big days. That's got to affect the appraisal. Now, I, I take issue with, you know, it was appraised at 76,000. Extraordinary conditions uh, was higher, and we're ordering like 10 times the 76,000. Wow, what a deal for the guy. That's a lot of money. 10 times over evaluation, that's speculation. Our town is going to speculate? I, I, I don't know what's, what's going on. I don't think that's good, but it's rare. <laughs> yeah, we gotta have it. So, so we're pulled out. I, 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 I'm just upset with, the, with that, and I'm, I'm gonna vote against this. Mr. Lelisher. Uh, okay. I, I just wanna make a comment on one of your points. Um, <clears throat> the 1.3 million is arrived at by having a small amount of development costs, you're right. But if, if you're the developer and you spend 1.3 million net, 
What are you going to then, and, and that's before the houses are built. <clears throat> then you're going to build houses, do all the rest of the site work, and you're going to sell four million dollar houses or whatever the price would be. They're going to be a big number in yeah. this town. So the full development cost is not in that number. It's just initial site preparation. There's a little bit of a hill next to the road. You're probably going to want to level that. You're going to want to cut down a lot of trees and you're going to want to build four houses. The 1.3 million is your starting cost. Then you do all that work and then you sell for whatever large houses. So this was not intended to be a full site preparation cost, if you will. That's, I just wanted to point that out. No, no, the, the appraiser did estimate $20,000 to uh, prepare the land. <laughs> well, he had a 10% development cost, yeah. which would be 220000 Yeah. Are you all set? That's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion? Yes, right in front. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Brown, Precinct 8. Well, I'm a pretty ar ar ardent conservationist. That's the way I like to think of myself. So this idea that we could get some land, even though it's mostly wet, is very appealing to me. But I share the concerns of the previous speaker. Having not gotten out of my car and walked the parcel, but I did drive down there and took a look at it. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of concrete forms on there. So who's, who's is, whose forms are those? Mr. Lillisher. Um, the property owner has graciously allowed us to take those with, if we want, and they're worth a lot of money. Oh, they're his, his, his property. Correct. OK. Um, Could you shed any light on how you got to 750000 Mr. Lillisher. Thank you. And that's not a figure the town arrived at in any way, shape, or form. We just put out an RFP, and that was the response we got back from the seller. We were offered the piece of land at 750000 take it or leave it. <coughs> and do we feel that there's any room for negotiation? Legally, there's none. If we were to reject it, they, yet they could come back at a later time, or not come back at a later time. Yeah. We'd have to restart the whole process, but yes, they could. Uh, um, it, it's hard for me to understand why someone would want to spend 750000 a house, a million dollars a house, to sit overlooking the wetlands, the bugs are going to be significant. As the previous speaker said, I can't imagine wanting to put a single family house in, in that location and listen to the constant, you know, rifle noises that emanate from there. They're not very far away. I mean, it's right, right there, right on top of it. It's going to be... I just don't see it. I don't understand why someone who has that kind of money would want to put themselves in that kind of environment. So I agree. I think that the concept that, you know, this land is going to sell for a lot of money, I just disagree with that. I think it's wrong. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think the concept that we should pay 750000 for this parcel, I don't support them. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. Uh, when I first read it, read the Articles 21, 22, 23, I said, oh my God, what a great opportunity. Uh, to get some land, I can remember when we had the opportunity to get where it was Johnson Woods, and then at the other end where there used to be the Spence Farm. 
the town had opportunities in both those, and unfortunately, that was a previous administration, but this town did not avail themselves of that opportunity. One of the reservations I had was when I thought, well, maybe they'll cut down the trees, and because I saw some mention of having recreational activities, which I, the town, it's in desperate need of additional recreational activities, but if I'm in favor of conservation, I don't want to see, you know, 100 trees or whatever the amount would be taken down. To me, the Article 21 is like a no-brainer. It's right, you know, it's, it's completely surrounded. It's a natural addition to what the town has now and would like to support and continue to have. On the other side, I agree. Cliffs, no, ba no backyard at all, right, right up to a mountain. People will, developers, if they can make a buck, they will do it. And I'm sure they will find some people who would be willing to pay the money. So 750000 you know, certainly to me is a lot of monies, but when I think in terms of what the developers are spending, I'm seeing $1.7 million house on Sumber Avenue. I thought when I saw the price that, that no, ridiculous, they'll never get that amount of money. They got that money. Another house in Summer Avenue, 1.5 million. These are both within the last couple of months. You have to be aware of what's going on out there as far as development and what, how much money is at stake and what they're willing to do. But more than anything else, I'd like to see the town protect as much land as possible. It's a valuable resource. You know, you, know, you can't replace it. That alone makes it you know, worthwhile, I think, for the expense. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, somebody hasn't spoken yet over here? Mr. Grant? Just, uh, sorry, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant, Precinct 4. Just one quick, quick clarifying question. I'm not entirely sure where the rifle range is. Is it possible to demonstrate a little bit better for me and maybe some others who don't know exactly where the rifle range is, never having been there myself? Mr. Lillisher. Thank you. Um, it's, at, it's at the end of this road. So it's, let me just get it right. This is all land that they own right here, but the actual range itself is out here. It's a very long range. I'm doing it approximately, but they own this parcel, this parcel, all these parcels, and then um, their, their ownership ends with Camp Curtis Guild somewhere off the map. But the actual range right now is further away off the map. And then in terms of the, the way it's laid out, is there any concern in terms of stray bullets? And I mean, it's a, I know it's a simple question, but that would be, I think, not just noise, would be a concern for someone building there, but actual risk. Um, the day that Carl McFadden drove me out there to see it and saw a glint in the distance, I had a great deal of concern about a stray <laughs> bullet. <laughs> um, one of the coaches that used the field said it's a home court advantage when the, uh, <laughs> the opponents literally hit the ground the first time they hear it. Um, I'm sure that kids would not be playing there if there was the least bit of concern. Again, the range is pretty far away. They actually shoot off towards Camp Curtis. There's probably more risk if Camp Curtis were using that portion than there is to any of these areas here. I actually have another question on a different topic. Is that sure. okay? Sure. Um, I just want to return to the um, sale of real estate funds, which I know some answers have already come on that one. Um, getting back to the idea that a Reading is already 100% developed, but you know, here we are with, with an opportunity. I do share some concern with others that you know, perhaps using a, a limited pool of funds to purchase wetlands might not be the most effective use, again, of these, this limited pool. Is, is there any way to have some, uh, some foresight into what else might become available, and would that then in turn be a better use of these limited funds than perhaps these lots that are proposed? 
Um, there's, there's no real telling what that may be. It's certainly nothing obvious. Um, town meeting has the right to amend the motion any way it sees fit. Um, for a discussion with the select board, we could have just proposed free cash and left the sale of real estate alone and the other account alone. But it seemed like this was, if you will, an off-beaten issue. Um, the town recently sold, recently being within five years, two single-family home lots and put money in there. And so effectively, it's kind of like a land swap. We sold these two disparate pieces for a house and we're buying it here. But town meeting can amend the source of funds any way it sees fit. You could use the free cash tonight. You could use it in the future, equally likely. But um, you know, even in looking at economic development opportunities down by Walker's Brook, it doesn't look to me like the town will be buying land. Rather, it may be more selling land. I can't see any use for it offhand. Okay. Thank you. For the discussion, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mario. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, I'm glad that the selectmen are got, going to rush in to put this into conservation. Uh, the late 60s, the early 70s, we gobbled up a lot of land in running for conservation purposes, only to find out later that we could have put ballparks in there. And if I'm correct, and I'm sure town council will correct me, once land is put into conservation, it's almost impossible to get it out I believe it takes an act of the state legislature to, to do that. So I, I hope you don't rush into it. Um, I think it's amazing that we've only been about three years, two to three years uh, looking at the purchase of a piece of property, but we've been since 1937 trying to decide whether we should sell a piece of property. <laughs> Further discussion? <laughs> yes. Where are we here? I guess that's true. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Chuck Robinson, Precinct 4. Uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned the pollution uh, question, you know, and then I heard further discussion about there might have been cons construction equipment stored there. I think it would be, I, I support this, but I think it would be prudent for the town as part of that purchase and sale to require a pollution assessment of that property. Thank you. Further discussion? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sekros? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitra Sekros, Precinct 4. So I'm going to be the unpopular girl tonight, but I'm used to it. I think we have enough ball fields in this town. Everywhere I go, I see them. I'm a conservationist. I also really like to plan for the future, and I believe in opportunity for the future. However, I did walk this land. Um, it's certainly not a beautiful, pristine place with a gorgeous view. It's crappy land up against wetland. The crappy land can be made to be beautiful, but it's going to require a lot more than $220,000. But we, as the developer, because that's what we'll be if we buy this, will be spending a lot of money to prepare it for whatever it's going to be. I looked at the RFP and I looked at the assessment. I understand it can't currently, the use can't be for a community center. So it seems to me that the general municipal use that you all have agreed that you want it for is going to end up being ball fields, which is creating, you know, a monoculture right up there with asphalt. Sorry. So um, I am. I have some process questions. I still don't understand why the Conservation Commission isn't brought into this process before. So I guess my question is, we are the buyer and we all say, yep, you can buy it, the 750000 part. What if, as Mr. Robinson just asked about, what if we find that there is a problem with the soil, with toxicity, whatever. What if we find that there's a lot more wetland in there that's been dumped on year after year, making an artificial mound, because that's what those hills are. They're not, that's not natural topography. Um, so what if there's more wetland? All you need are two species, and, and then it's wetland. So if we go into this, we say yes, then we discover that we're not getting quite what we thought we were getting. 
it's still ours. Is that correct? Mr. Lozier. First, I want to address a point that you made that it is for general municipal purposes. We certainly could build a community center there. It's not, it's not narrowed down to you know, athletics or recreational space. It could be anything that the town chooses to do, just to clear that up. There's no telling um, what the land may actually hold. All we know is we've had two different experts uh, go in at two different times and look at it and made different assessments. Uh, the seller has assessed that there is more wetlands than what the town had previously um, looked at. <laughs> Conservation will be the final word. I assume it's somewhere in between those two hmm. answers. As to the site condition, a PNS will take care of some of that. Um, certainly under state and federal law, if there's material in the soil, the seller is always responsible in, you know, throughout eternity for it, just like we are for the landfill up by Jordan's. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have another question, is that okay? Sure. About sort of process. Um, do we have, or do you have any idea at all, and the reason that I mentioned the community center, and I'm, I guess I'm assuming that that's off the books, is because if the town buys it, we can change our rules. Because it says in, the, in what I read today on the website, um, I mean, it's, the use is, it says no <laughs> for community center. I really don't know what you're referring to. Okay, I'll find it and I'll show it to you later. Okay. Um, do we have any idea how much it's going to cost to make it developable at all into either a ball field or something else? Mr. Lowisher. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. We have no idea what the town wants to do with it, so no, we have no idea what it may cost. So Certainly uh, a ball field would be cheaper than building a building. So my final question then is, I feel like town meeting's often in a rush to get something done. You mentioned it, uh, Ms. Alvarado, that we're kind of in a rush. And I, I well, it bothers me that we seem to be in a rush a lot and we don't have a lot of information. So it seems a little backwards. The two plots that are islands, um, one you mentioned you would like to see boardwalks through and passive recreation, which would be nice because there's not a lot of that in Reading. That's a $25,000 cost, is that correct? for that property? The 25,000 is to buy the property, correct? It's nothing to do with what we might do with the property, what constitutes Understood. And is the same island 25K, the other one? Correct. Okay. Why, I understand wanting to add conservation land. Unlike Mr. Brown over there, I think it's a good idea. However, this land can never be built on. No one can shoot a gun on it. There's still bow hunting allowed, but otherwise, I would like to understand more why that's um, why that's a justified expenditure in your mind, Mr. Lozier. I, I don't get to decide what's justified. You do. Um, that's the offer. Uh, that's an offer that the select board authorized me to make. It's the fairest answer I can give you, Mr. Friedman. Andy Friedman, um, Precinct 4, Select Board. Um, Mr. Herrick, your question about access from Haverhill Street, the assessor uh, stated that, that due to wetlands that was highly unlikely, that approach. Um, Mr. Simmons, I, I hear what you're saying about development, development costs that was not really looked into very thoroughly in the, in the appraisal. Um, and um, I hear others' concerns about conservation land, uh, need for uh, another sports complex, or preferring not to have a sports conflict, uh, a complex. Um, I also respect the, um, well, I, 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 speculation is such a negative uh, word, but it's essentially coming up with a number to propose to buy this land, um, a, a lot of 
assumptions had to go into it without a lot of certainty. So um, you, you could call that speculation. Uh, I'm highly in favor of purchasing the property, uh, the 15 acres south of uh, the Burbank Arena, and um, precisely because we just don't have that, those parcels of land available in Reading anymore, and I, I'd like to see it under control of the town. Is $750,000 too much? Is it overpriced? Perhaps. But um, nevertheless, to buy uh, 15 acres of land in our town for $750,000, uh, I think that it is, that is a good long-term investment for um, the next generation and the generation after that to have control over that parcel. So um, I, I hear your concerns, um, but I guess I would agree with Mr. O'Neill. I think we should take this parcel um, um, as we're being as it's being offered, and 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 lock it into the town of Reading for the future. Thank you, Ms. O'Neill. O'Neill, precinct four. I'm going to say that I'm a conservationist and not qualified by however or but or whatever else. Uh, this is a great opportunity, and as my husband mentioned, if you remember, the developer of Johnson Wood Farms on West Street bought like 35 acres for 3.5 million and is selling hundreds of units at eight to a million plus. So he's making a fortune off the town of Reading that we pretty much ended up getting nothing out of, even the trails that he said he would put in. I understand there's very, you know, that's all been built in down there. And the same with Spence Farm. We didn't even get a ball field out of that. This is an opportunity. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, the Timberneck area is close to houses. Bow hunting is bow hunting. Arrows can go astray. So just as they were concerned about guns in that area, you can be the same about bow hunting. It would be great to have that as one complete parcel. We're still allowing, even though we say um, Reading is 100% developed, you'll still see right now huge amounts of trees being torn down off Main Street, off Lowell Street, to these million dollar home developments. We're losing many, many trees and we're not doing anything to restore them. We have very little expectation that people, you know, replace any of the trees they take down. So this is our small, um, wonderful opportunity to get these parcels at what I consider reasonable prices. I hope we will uh, do this. I'm very pleased that we have this opportunity. My other point is that I don't feel this is rushed. I feel that the Board of Selectmen, the previous board before the election, this board now has looked at this, has talked to people. Uh, we're going to have a community process. Um, this is a chance. I feel I have enough information on this to move forward. I hope you will all support it. Thank you. Mr. Lillicher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I want to complete an answer that Town Council reminded me of. Um, in addition to whatever laws exist in the purchase and sale, I hadn't been really thinking negatively enough. In the purchase and sale, if there's some horrific condition that none of us could have known is there, we can just cancel this. So just to be clear, we will do due diligence after the fact. And once we went through the RFP process, we could not walk the land. We could not invite CONSCOM in there legally once that process began. At this point, it must be three-ish three months ago. And that's why that clause is in there. Since the due diligence follows, we do have the right to walk away. Ms. Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so I, I want to take a moment to appreciate um, one of the previous speakers. Um, I also share a dislike of being asked to make decisions um, quickly. Um, however, the timing of this particular article um, wasn't under our control. The owners brought it before us in January, was it? January of this year. Um, the urgency is that the owners are ready to sell or otherwise take action. Um, we are responding as best we can given the circumstances. Um, the thing that I think is worth noting here is that the future use of it, if it is town owned, is up to us. Whether that means we keep it as conservation, whether we develop it, 
um, when we put a building on it or we make a ball field, the decision is ours. Um, if we choose to take no action, we do run the risk of losing the opportunity to make that decision. Um, so the best chance to control it is to own it. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Burkhart, Precinct 2. Uh, I come to this microphone just to illustrate that I'm speaking as a citizen, not as a member of the Finance Committee. Um, I, I did vote as a member of the Finance Committee to support these articles because I do think it good, makes good financial sense for the town. Um, but personally speaking, uh, as a citizen with respect to Article 21 particularly, um, there was a previous comment that no, you cannot, uh, uh, because of the actions of body a couple years ago, to amend the firearms bylaw, you now cannot discharge a firearm uh, in that area of Timberneck Swamp. However, there is still bow hunting there. Um, I'm going to butter to Timberneck Swamp. My boys play in those woods. The older they get, the farther they go out into those woods. The neighborhood boys, and they're all boys in this neighborhood, play in those woods. And so from my perspective, um, very much in support of Article 21 just for that purpose alone. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Moderator. Peter Brown from Precinct 8. Uh, Article 21 is a no-brainer. Yes, this, this, we, should, we should buy it. Um, I'd like people to just, you know, we're talking, this article that we're talking about, we're talking about the future and what, you know, owning some, you know, some land that, you know, from a conservation point of view, is certainly attractive. I think there are some questions about expense to develop it at all. If there's that much concrete on the land, and certainly the land is not in a natural condition, it's been, it's been developed, and, and we've heard, heard the assurance of town council that, and, and, and from Mr. Lesher that, you know, we will, you know, you know, you'll do your, your site, you know, evaluation. That's, that's great. But here's what I want to say. This is, this is a different point. $750,000. I can, I can suggest where we spend $750,000 today uh, in an existing town forest area uh, where the wellhead was, where we could have a ball field, I think. Maybe you could comment on that at the end of the road by the compost, where we can improve access to the compost, where hundreds of people go every weekend, they take their dog down Stroud Avenue, and they walk by all the cars that are bringing leaf and all the, you know, detritus from our yards there. It's a, it's a hazardous, uh, situation. I ha I myself have almost been hit walking on that on that road. Uh, fortunately, I was not, but I was lucky because the driver never even saw me. So we could improve access there. We could improve parking. We could get parking off of the the main street. We would make the neighbors, I'm sure, very happy. We could take 750,000. We could improve the trails in the town forest. We could have a ball field. We could do all that now with a little forethought and a little planning without the extra expense of if we want to develop uh, uh, Article 22, the land site there. So that, that's my only comment. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Ventura? Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Um, just as I got a closer look, I could see the dimensions. Uh, dimensionally, a ball field isn't going to fit in that parcel. Um, regulation Little League field is 200 feet from home plate to the fence, and we'd be hard pressed to squeeze it in there, especially if we hit any buffers. Um, uh, secondly, um, to the um, lady's point over there, uh, she sees a million ball fields. Uh, I served on the Reading Little League board for a tenure of five years. 
Field space is at a premium. Um, when I was on board, spring registrations were over 500 kids um, just for the spring season alone. And now it's, it's a three season um, event. Field space is still at a premium. Um, I, I would almost say sell the easement because that's a great spot for high density development, to be honest with you. Um, sort of out of the way, we can get the money and we can improve our facilities. Um, we talked about the lighting. Um, when I was on, when I served on the Little League board, um, the lighting, when it was coming, we were like, oh wow, our field problems are going to be uh, mitigated tremendously. Um, right now in the fall, games get cut short after three innings, um, three or four innings because of darkness. Um, we could have an extra game a day at night um, would help solve the field problems that we have. Fix what we have and a lot of the problems go away. Um, the little isolated parcels, um, I was part of the meeting on the Timberneck Swamp area. I too, um, I live across the street from Eric practically. I, I did see hunting stands within 50 feet of my neighbor's house. They weren't abiding by the rules. Um, which was my biggest thing. Um, I'm not against hunting. I, I remember all the NRA people in the back of trying to explain to them, I'm not against you guys, but you're not following the rules and we don't really enforce it. It's an isolated piece of property. It's going to be, it's almost like Conservation Commission, but it's free. <laughs> Sorry, he's sort of stuck with it. Um, so my thought, sell the easement, fix what we have. Um, I think that's a great spot actually for high, high density development is going to come. And we already saw the stink it made in town with the developments uptown. That's right near the ice rink, it's sort of not near single residences, it's out of the way. Um, we need it, if, we're, if we keep chasing it, it's right there. But just to be clear, a ball field will not fit on that parcel. You just can't get it on there. So if anyone has dreams of a ballpark going there, unless we fill in wetlands, it's not going to happen. Thank you. Mr. Lillichair. Thank you, Mr. Thank Moderator. You. Um, just to clarify on any use, um, you would do a master plan of all the town-owned land at that point. So a new ball field doesn't only have to fit in the newly acquired land. For instance, a lot of that parking lot in the back is just gravel. That could be taken into effect. So it's, you don't have to squeeze something only into um, the new land. To, to that point, if you've been at a night where the Reading High School team plays hockey, or if there's a major game going on at Simmons, parking can be hard um, on, those, on those few nights. Mr. Lawless, yeah. Um I have been there and, and parking was impossible. I'm not suggesting we remove the parking, just reconfigure the space and use it more efficiently. Okay, in the middle of the, uh, yes, uh, I can't say who you are, okay, yep. Boyman. Uh, Nick Boyman, Precinct 7. Um, two sets of comments and questions. First, uh, as to Article 21, it was called a no-brainer earlier. I view it as a safety issue. Mr. Burkhardt brought this out. I think it's important for us as a body to do what's, what's right for this town in terms of safety of its residents. I put the purchase of Article 21 within that category. I strongly favor it. I have a lot more questions about Articles 22 and 23. Um, I put them in three categories, right? So one is questions about the owner. Second is questions about ownership, if we are going to become the owners. And the third is questions about the easement and its market value or potential market value. So to take those in order. Uh, questions about the owner. Do we know anything about the history of this parcel and whether how recently this was purchased uh, and the owner and whether they purchased and sold other other parcels within Reading? Mr. Lillisher. Um I understand the family has owned the parcel for the better part of 100 years. Um, they've owned other parcels in town. I'm not sure why that's relevant, though. I'm just curious whether there's anything we can learn about whether the parcel was recently purchased. Why, why is the parcel hitting the market at this time? It sounds like just for historical and re reasons unrelated to the merits of the property. Um, I can say I'm not aware of them buying any parcels in recent years whatsoever. They're just winding up their estate, if you will. Okay. Uh, I found that helpful. Thank you. Um, what about the, have there any, been any applications for permits, for building permits on this property that we would know of? 
Have there been? Yes. No, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, questions about ownership? Moving to the second topic. Um, what have we looked at in terms of the cost of if we, if we own this property? Um, assuming, setting aside Mr. Robinson's point earlier, that if there are any material defects with the land that we have to remediate, that wouldn't be a cost to the town there you know, legally. Uh, so assume we don't find anything that we don't have to pay for. What's the cost of just owning it, maintaining it as, as is? The first thing we do is take all that concrete curbing away or granite curbing away and we have a profit. I don't see any cost of maintenance of the property as it is if we just left it as it is. Okay. And last question is about the cost of or, or the, the value of that easement. So two questions there. One is, is it possible for the, there's that one property where Little Treasure Schoolhouse is located on the map that we have in front of us. It appears that that property abuts the, pro, the parcel in question. Is, is it would it be permitted under zoning laws or other rules for the private owner there to sell an easement? I think someone said earlier there was a wetlands issue with that, but I wanted to make that clear. Mr. Lillisher. Um Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm not aware, aware of any wetlands issue there. I'm not saying there isn't. I, I just don't know if there is. Um, you know, we do have subdivision rules. It's perfectly within the right of any one of those abutters to, to think about that and do it. Um, it may need a waiver from CPDC depending on the exact details, but it's not, it's, it's plausible that any one of them could do that. So it's possible that the, the value of this easement would be capped at whatever the value that a private party is willing to sell it for elsewhere? I, it's, that's a complicated question. The value of the easement is very hard to determine. It's something between 76,000 and a million three. But, beyond, we, beyond but we would not have a monopoly on selling that easement. There would be at least one other property that could sell that easement. I would say that, that yeah, that's possible. It, it could be that you would have to actually sell your whole parcel to do that, though, so it would require someone being willing to leave their house. Okay. So for, for this property, I think if it's a, it's a 14 acres, four acres of which are buildable, potentially. Uh, and then I want to confirm my understanding that Article 23, the additional 10 acres are contingent upon the purchase of the Article 22 land. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So in my view, if the purpose is to take these 24 acres off market right, and, and to preserve them for what, as a good in itself, this is the price to do that, and this is the opportunity before this body. If the purpose is to harvest some upside of four acres out of the 24 acres, I think that's at this point strikes me as, as select board member Friedman pointed out, speculative in my view. So I'm not counting on the upside, but I think if, if this body wants to spend this money to pull 24 acres off the market and be the proud owner of it, that's the, that's the opportunity before us. So thank you for your time. Right on the edge here, Mr. Rorock. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct uh, 2. Uh, I think just a reminder to go back to the original uh, comment from Ms. Alvarez. It's a, really a, it's acquisition versus development. So uh, I think there's hundreds more development opportunities that we're all going to be able to think about that really aren't germane. Uh, the land is valuable in and of itself. I think the conservation alone makes it worthwhile at the price. and. Uh, I also think that uh, we do want to keep it in the control of the town of Reading now and in the future. So uh, I recommend voting yes on this one. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Mrs. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. If there are about four developable, developable acres, why is it thought that only four houses would go in there? We don't have any. Is it the configuration of it or? Mr. Sure. Um, I, I can't know what the uh, appraiser was thinking, but I do know it's S40 zoning, so you need an acre in order to build a single family house oh, you there. you do. And I assume that's one of the thoughts he had. Okay, so in that area, you do need a single uh, an Unless acre. Unless you got a waiver, yes. Okay. Um, I agree with the previous speakers that this is a really, uh, these opportunities don't come up very often, so I'm in favor of this. Thank you. Further right discussion. Mr. Graham. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Russ Graham, Precinct 4. The reason I asked the question before the Finance Committee is because I wanted to hear what they in fact say. Through the years, whether it be economic development, whether it be recreation, whether it be zoning, one ugly thing always rears its head. We don't have the land. I'll give you a perfect example of where our forefathers I think I'm rapidly becoming a forefather, but um, 
me were very wise and very prudent. They set aside land off of Franklin Street for years, and it was discussed for many different uses. It never was used. Finally, Reading needed a new elementary school. The single biggest problem with building a school in most towns and cities is you must come up with the land and the SBAB will not pay for one dime of that land. So when we went to build an elementary school, their jaws almost dropped when they said, you know, you need 10 to 13 acres to do this. And I said, yep, and we have it. If we had had to buy that land, if we had had to move on eminent domain to get that land, if we had had to sacrifice parks or recreation to get that land, we would have been in serious trouble. And I think our forefathers very wisely said, the one thing we don't have enough of in this little less than 10 square mile town is land. Whenever the opportunity, whether it be rushed or otherwise, arises for us to get some of that land, let's satisfy that hunger. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Ms. Ms. Webb, did you have a... Ms. No? Oh, okay. Um, yes, up in the back. Hi, I'm Sean Neville. I'm from Precinct 1. I live a little less than a half mile north of here. Um, as someone who drops their kids off at Little Treasures every morning, and dozens of parents do so on that road right there, I, I don't think this is a great location for high density. I know we're not supposed to speculate on what it could become down the line, but I don't think that's a good idea. Um, a, a couple questions, and I've been taking notes as the conversation kind of moves from here, and I, I hope they're quick questions. Um, without an easement, no development could happen there, right? There's no way they could bypass any sort of zoning that, that they could put some sort of uh, project in there in the future. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I want to be real careful. There are legal avenues open, but they all lead towards needing an easement, correct? Okay. Uh, in the, the 750000 I my understanding was that that is a non-negotiable price point, and that came from the the seller side, not not the town side. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so I'm going to say that I support this whole idea. Um, I was a bit struck by um, or cautious about the urgency of it, uh, given that without the easement, something might not be able to happen, and we can perhaps say no on this and punt it. Uh, but with the potential offer on the table and getting it done and getting four acres of developable land uh, on the town side, uh, I'm going to support it. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tony DiRezzo, Precinct 2. Uh, as the last commenter had pointed out, this is a non-negotiable price but that's because it's an RFP. So the question I have is, would it be appropriate for this body to reduce the price that we're willing to pay for the property? <laughs> I'm yielding the balance of my time. Mr. Harris. Coward. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, the terms of the purchase and sale agreement are signed already. If this uh, body does not appropriate the money, then under the terms of the, con of the purchase and sale agreement, the deal is off. So if you, if you uh, appropriate less than all of the money that's set forth in the uh, purchase and sale agreement, um, that effectively nullifies the agreement. But the agreement could then be renegotiated, correct? Uh, a new RFP would have to be issued, this time with an additional fact in it, which is town meeting has appropriated X dollars for this purchase. 
that may or may not um, cause this bidder or someone else to take interest. Then, Mr. Moderator, I would like to make an amendment to Article 22. Okay, right now, technically, Article 21 is before this body, so I will call on you when, after we've taken the vote for Article 21. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Further discussion? Ms. Webb. Moderator Elaine Webb, Precinct 1. Um, I just want to clarify. So are we, the question is just Article 21 right now? I'm allowing um, discussion on all three, but we only Article 21 is before the body right now. Okay. I'd like to just move the question. Okay. Is there a second? Second. This requires a two-thirds vote. Um, do I have my counter from last week? Mr. Brown, would you take your side plus the uh, Finance Committee? Mr. Crook, would you take the your side of the of the wire in the center, Ms. Hillary, the other side of the center, and Mr. Pacino, would you take the left and the uh, select board? Now, we are, the motion before us is to end debate on Article 21. All those in favor, please rise. Thirty-four. Thirty-four. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Forty-three. Forty-three. Forty-four. Forty-four. And those opposed, please rise. Five. Five. Correct. Yes. Three. 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 Four. Four. The, the vote being 144 in the affirmative, 15 in the negative. Excuse me, it's 145 in the affirmative, 15 in the negative. The motion to end debate has carried, and we will now take a vote on the motion under Article 21. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please rise. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. <coughs> Forty-two. Forty-two. Forty-five. Forty-five. And those opposed, please rise. One. 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 Four. Four. Zero. Zero. The vote being 152 in the affirmative, six in the negative, the motion carries. Now business under Article 2, I will begin with Mr. DeRezzo. I'm sorry, was there a question? What did I say? Oh, <laughs> excuse me, Article 22. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Tony DeRezzo, Precinct 2. I would like to amend the motion under Article 22 to reduce the amount transferred from sale of real estate fund to $400,000. Is there a second? No second? A second, okay. Mr. DeRezzo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, as we noted that there is no negotiation with the RFP, this body is the only opportunity the town will have to negotiate. If the uh, seller would accept the $600,000 versus the $750,000. The Board of Selectmen would be able to make the sale immediately. Otherwise, they would have to wait at least till November town meeting for the sale. Thank you. Okay, further discussion on this proposed amendment? 
been appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Further discussion under Article 22. On the, uh, Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, just a quick question, I apologize on this. Um, if the town does, in fact, purchase this lot, um, and through the discussions decides that perhaps instead of maintaining it under a municipal use, that we find some alternative use that may involve development outside, um, is the town able at that point to reconfigure the lot to include the piece that's missing from an easement perspective and then redo zoning and all that fun stuff to get it to a point where it could actually then satisfy some other development use? Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. With all due respect to the seller in the room, yes, we absolutely could. Okay. Thank you very much. Further discussion? Okay, the one behind the uh, town meeting members in the, in the back. Hi, um, I'm Bob Coulter, Precinct 6. Um, it's been mentioned a couple times about Johnson Woods and Spence Farm. This body had the opportunity to purchase that land and it chose not to and they turned it to Chapter 40 Bs. That will happen here. Someone who's smart, they'll buy a land, they'll get access. It's a steal to get there for $750,000. Johnson Woods wants to buy adjacent properties for $600,000 to build new units. So getting this for $750,000 would be a great opportunity for Reading. We could do what we want with it. You could build fields, you could maybe do another rink, you could build a building, you could leave it for conservation. But don't miss out on the opportunity because someone will take this opportunity and someone will build on it. And it won't be what you like. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Ms. Landry. Ann Landry, Precinct 5. A previous speaker had mentioned that this had been uh, reviewed by the old board and the new board. I just wanted to make clear that because of timing, uh, I was not yet serving on the select board when this was reviewed and I was no longer serving on the finance committee when the finance committee reviewed it. But as a town meeting member, based on what I've read and what I have heard, um, I feel confident in voting yes on this as a, a unique opportunity for a smart investment in our future. Thanks. Did we have a separate FinCom report on this article? Oh, do one report on that? I'm sorry, I skipped by you. Uh, I, thanks, man. I reported on all three articles. Oh, you did? One, okay, that one, was, yeah. that's what I was asking. Okay, fine. Uh, yes, in the far corner. Thank you, Mary Ann Downing, Precinct 3. Um, I'm generally in favor of this, but I did want to follow up on the elephant in the room, the 40B question. Um, has anyone figured out, maybe in planning, once, like a guesstimate, once we have the 2020 census, how we're going to fall, how many affordable units we're going to fall short? Because it seems like 40, our t magic 10% threshold will be gone at that time. Mr. Lillisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I saw an old number. I don't know how accurate it is, but we're going to be more than 100 units short um, just based on when this um, census comes in in 2020. So that, you know, greatly increases the likelihood that this could turn into that, but also that we would need it. I mean, if not here, then we're going to start getting, you know, things in the middle of neighborhoods too. Um, so did anyone do an estimate that if we let a 40B go there, and again, I don't support that, how much tax revenue if it, we might get from it? Mr. Lillisher. Uh, uh, no, um, thank you, Ms. Monterey. There's just no telling. We haven't done any work like that at all. Okay, so because like with Redding Woods, right, we have 424 or so condos. We get about three million from there. I don't know. Okay, just, and just as a last unrelated question. Um, there was a gentleman who asked earlier that there's other things we could do with the 750000 but in fact, aren't we, are we restricted with the name, 
named uses of the money to be able to say, oh, let's take you know the land sale fund and go use it to build fields in the compost. We can't really do that, can we? Still well sure. Um, we'd have to ask council and bond council. That's probably something we could do. It's capital, so it, it probably would qualify. Um, uh, a board of selectmen many years ago did start exploring that area, and there was a lot of neighborhood resistance. So it's not, you know, you do want to try to build things away from houses, um, but you also have to consider the access and the access to um, the town forest, you know, with increasing the traffic would be much larger. Here there's already a hockey rink, so one would suppose the access is more, you know, people are more used to it. Okay, thank you, that's all. Further discussion? Yes, right here. Stephen Cole, Pre Precinct 6. Do I understand correctly that no one has looked at each scenario for the use of this land if the town does not buy it and looked at the projected tax revenues and the projected school expenses? Is that correct? Mr. Lillisher. Um, respectfully, you're so far down the path that we haven't gone that no, we haven't. We look at that when developments are being discussed, absolutely. So I have a, I have a rule of thumb. If you look at um, the development where the old Addison Wesley was, um, this is uh, the one on um, uh, where the old Atlantic was. I sound like an old timer now. <laughs> um, you get two very different sets of math. It depends on what kind of people move in, what kind of units you offer. Right. Um, one of those is financially very attractive to the town. The other one is not at all. Characterize those for me, please. Um, the Describe one, them. The one where Addison Wesley was uh, costs the town money both in education and public safety. So it depends on exactly what you build and exactly who moves in. So what are the possible uses for this? First I heard four single family homes on four acres, one acre each. So that sounds like a net benefit to the town. We're looking at at least $50,000 a year in uh, tax revenue, I presume, and not that many children potentially added to the, to the uh, roles. But can this be used for multifamily development, apartments, condos? Mr. Lillisher. What's your average spend per pupil at this point, uh, Dr. Doherty? Yeah, so if... Could you repeat that, Bob? Certainly. The, the break-even that you just suggested would be four children in the total in four units, then the town would break even. Any more than four children, the town would, if you will, be behind for the period of time when they're in school. Um, the discussion in front of the body in terms of uh, dense housing is all speculative. Um, you know, it depends on a number of things, but in two or three years from now, that's not off the not off the table. It could happen, and the town has no say. It is correct then that apartments, condos, could be built on this land. Correct? Theoretically, yes. Oh, so could so we could see dozens of of uh, families and uh, 1.2 children each, or you know whatever the average is these days. It's it's at least possible, yes. Okay, and so what might, in a scenario like that, what might the uh, net uh, revenue to the town be, or loss to the town, cost to the town? Mr. Lillisher. Uh, Mr. Mowder, I've already said that I can't really answer these speculative questions on the fly like that. Um, again, well, with the two projects I cited, there's such a wide range of what the outcomes could be. But shouldn't Finance Committee or someone be doing this kind of analysis? Before I start a project, I look at, at uh, the various uh, scenarios, likely and uh, modestly likely. Yes, we have a finance committee for answer. Should I use the other microphone? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sean Brandt, Precinct 8. Um, one of the reasons that I'm personally in favor of this, of voting for this, is that control over those outcomes is exactly what we get out of owning the, owning the property. And so, um, you know, for us to be able to do those analyses when we have real projects in front of us, we'll get there when the time is appropriate, but we'll have that control if we own the property. We won't if, <clears throat> if excuse me, if this body votes it down tonight. But that, th there's nothing definite about that. That's, uh, you know, whatever the decision of uh, whoever is on FinCom, I guess, and planning, uh, let's see, zoning commission, 
you know, they would decide at that time, correct? Mr. Chair, um, just to be clear, if, if this body votes this down, it will be the seller that decides what to do and, and possibly a developer he would sell it to. They, would, they may need to ask permission of some of the bodies you cited, but very little. Okay, so it, it does sound to me respectfully like there hasn't been enough uh, analysis of the uh, possible outcomes done at this time. Further discussion? Yes, we're on the edge. Going to the precinct six. Um, two things. Well, a question first. Um, he had, I believe you mentioned there was a p potential profit from the sale of the concrete forms. Profit of what? The cleanup or the whole purchase? Mr. Lelisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, profit in the sense we acquired some things we could use for free. Okay. But would that cover any portion would, of that 750? We're not going to put them on eBay. We're actually going to use them. <laughs> No, I understood. I'm just wondering, like, what level of profit are we talking about? <laughs> when DPW found out what, what was there, they were quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my other statement was more of, um, in terms of what can be built and what people will pay for, I mean, living down behind Barrows, there was a private plot of land that had split property recently that they took it down, about 40 trees, leveled a mound. It was within 35 feet and of the conservation land. So if a private person does buy this, there is the way they can get through conservation, they can get through other zoning, through the laws, and build stuff on these lands. We, we you know, two houses down from me, I'm evident of that nice house went up, but again, it's shoehorned in there. There's no land that's right overlooking the creek, right overlooking the, the conservation land behind, and then looking at the target sign behind that. So. Um, just keep that in mind that there are ways through the conservation to get these things built. And I also assume if we want people to build four plots of land, we can sell that later to a developer as well. Is that correct? correct. If we so chose to go down that path. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Brown. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Monitor. Ian Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, so it, it seems to me that a lot of this is about control. Uh, and so I guess my question is, uh, if we, let me make sure I understand this right, if we do not sell the land and we do not give them the uh, appeasement, there, uh, Bob, you said that there are legal avenues they can take uh, to still use the land. Mr. Lelisher. The land was taken from them by the federal government in the 1950s. The records the federal government kept were very poor. If I were them, I would have an argument on this issue. That's all I'm saying. So I guess my question becomes, and you can ballpark it for me percentage-wise, how likely is it that they're actually able to keep control and then sell to build to a developer? over Mr. us. Mr. Lozier. Considering they're listening to you right now, I'd say they're quite high. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, thank you. Where are the discussion? Yes, Mr. Weld. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Weld, Precinct 8. I'd like to move the question, if we could. Okay, this requires a two-thirds vote to end debate. I think I still have my original counters. All those in favor of ending debate, Please rise. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Forty-four. Forty-four. Forty-three. Forty-three. And those opposed to ending debate. Three. Three. Eight. Eight. <laughs> uh, eight. Okay. Three. Three. 
Three. Three. The vote being 142 in the affirmative and 17 in the negative, the question has been moved and we will move on to the uh, question itself. All those in favor of the motion under Article 22, please rise. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Forty-five. Forty-five. Forty-one. Forty-one. And those opposed? Zero. Zero. <coughs> Four. 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 One. Four and one. Four. Okay. The vote being 148 in the affirmative, 9 in the negative, the motion carries. Business under Article 23. Is there discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two thirds vote. All those in favor, please rise. Thirty-nine. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Forty-five. Forty-five. Forty-two. Forty-two. And those opposed? Zero. So. One. One. Three. Three. Zero. Zero. The vote being 153 in the affirmative, four in the negative, the motion carries. Okay, that brings us back to Article 16. Let me flip my page here. Business under Article 16, Mr. Lillishore. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dr. Doherty and I would like to request more than 10 minutes. Is there any uh, objection? None appearing. Continue, Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, town meeting. <clears throat> I'm going to give a brief introduction and an overview of the project. Dr. Doherty will then get into more details, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, I want to start by saying that our, our building security project team consists of two parts. The operational team is L Lieutenant Detective Richard Body, who's our first school resource officer and the current supervisor of SROs, so he certainly has the right experience. Um, the school CFO, Gail Dowd, facilities director, Joe Huggins, and the facilities assistant director, Kevin Cabuzzi. And then uh, layered on top of that are the bureaucrats, the uh, town manager, the superintendent, and the deputy chief. So together, all seven of us constitute uh, the security project team. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the four operational people that are little, literally doing all the work, if you will. Um, and then as needed, supplementally, we call in the two school resource officers, um, any or all of the school building principals, Fire Chief and Assistant Fire Chief, they're the emergency management directors, and then other town departments and staff. And just to say it once out loud for both Dr. Doherty and myself, this capital project is the single highest priority we have. I'm going to take you through two slides of a timeline. Um, over two years ago, as part of the FY17 budget, town meeting approved $125,000 of funding in the spring of 2016, three years ago. We hired Nangle Engineering from Danvers to develop an RFQ. That summer, uh, TRC of Lowell was hired for the security study. Um, it's really important. One of the first points I want to make is that they're an independent firm. Their compensation has nothing to do with the project that is ultimately built or selected. Um, secondly, in September of 2016, there was a kickoff meeting with myself, the superintendent, and town department heads 
followed one month later with a meeting with the school principals. In June of 2017, so you can see nine months later, TRC completed their security study. And the documents uh, related to the study are all exempt from public records law. That's something I will come back to. Uh, the first of two executive sessions was held in August of 2017. Um, members of three elected boards, the trustees, the school committee, and the then uh, selectmen, in addition to members of fin FinCom, uh, saw a, a presentation that was actually quite lengthy at the time um, from TRC. <coughs> At that meeting in the winter, um, that operational team, four members primarily, worked on uh, dispatch center redesign, which was thought to be the first and most important part of this uh, to get out of the way, and then cost estimates and all the component pieces of the study uh, that was given to us. In April of 2018, that's one year ago, Town meeting approved $500,000 to rebuild, if you will, the dispatch center to reconfigure it for this project. Um, work went on for the next six months. In October, our procurement officer uh, met with both the select board and the school committee to review some new procurement law, the designer selection law specifically, and the school committee and myself adopted it for each side of, of our government. In November of 18, we asked this body to repurpose the 500,000 from the dispatch center um, to be for building security design services, and that's under the new procurement law that had just been adopted. Because the project was thought to be or known to be more than a million and a half dollars, again, by law under this new uh, configuration, we had to hire an owner's project manager. Um, so that RFQ went out uh, this, this winter, and STV of Newton was hired as the project manager uh, this winter. Um, that's another key point. That's a second, not only independent person or group, but it's actually someone on our side. Um, STV and the specific project manager, Bob Lebrecht, worked with us on the library project. Uh, he knows facilities department and myself quite well. Um, he, he saved well more than we paid him in construction costs on the library. I don't know if he can pull that off again, but I'm thrilled certainly that he's, he's on our team. Um, he's, he, he will be the second person who not only is not paid to do something silly, but he's paid to stop from that, that from happening. <clears throat> uh, TRC, STV, and then the staff worked together on the project scope this winter and updated some cost for, forecasts. An executive session was held earlier this month. Um, we could not spend as much time due to another meeting being scheduled right after. Uh, but those board members that could attend and FinCom members, FinCom did not have a quorum, um, did review uh, the same summary, if you will, of that uh, security study. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I thought it was important that you understand why some information is public and why some is not. Um, the Homeland Security Act of 2002 has a portion called the Safety Act. Um, it doesn't exactly fit the acronyms, but it support anti-terrorism by fostering efficient technologies. That was close enough. Um, that's setting up a system of risk and legal management. Um, I will just quote to you from what the security study has. This document contains sensitive information um, relating to the security of safety of persons, buildings, and other critical infrastructure within the town of Reading because releasing this document may significantly jeopardize the safety and security of the public. This document is exempt from release pursuant to exemption N of the public records law, Mass General Law, Chapter 4, Section 7, 26B. Do not disclose or provide this document to any non-authorized individual without a prior approval from the Town of Reading Director of Facilities. Um, we'll certainly field questions on this topic, but it's something that I feel very strongly about, and I, I do need to tell you that there is information that we have that we will not share um, because it's the security of especially children. For the executive sessions that we held recently, all attendees did sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, the reason we had executive session was twofold. One is we weren't sure what discussion might come up. So even though we knew what we shouldn't say, we didn't know what other people might say in the room. Um, and this is just another, if you will, belt and suspenders layer of security on the documents themselves. Um, we know they're protected, but this doubly protects them. Next.
next steps in this project to conclude my remarks will be this request is to authorize $4 million of debt uh, to pay the costs of making security improvements. Um, if it is approved this summer, both the operational and managerial team will get together to finalize the scope. We'll also fine tune the pricing. Um, at that point, uh, we'll be preparing for a November 2019 town meeting um, to have schematic designs done and to give you what update we can um, on the project and its state at that point. And, and it's important, we've been discussed in the last two months, it is important that you know right up front that it is highly likely that we will come to you in November and ask that a $400,000 capital item currently listed as FY22 be moved up. Um, the, the equipment, this is for radio equipment for police and fire. It's not strictly part of this project. It's not absolutely in dire need of being repaired. Uh, but if we are going to reconfigure configure the dispatch center, it's, it's really the time to do this work, as opposed to trying to do it later and retrofit it in. This would be the right time. So at this point, I want to turn the presentation over to Dr. Doherty, and then I'll come back to wrap it up. Dr. Doherty. Thank you, town meeting members. Um, before I go into a little bit more detail of the process that's been used uh, over the last few years, I just want to discuss the why for a second. I think the why is obvious, but I think it's important to emphasize that the why is for the safety and security of our town and school staff and our students. Um, about five and a half years ago, there was a tragedy that occurred in Danvers High School. Um, after that tragedy occurred, uh, town manager and I had several conversations and we decided that we needed to take a good look at our town and school buildings. Not only the infrastructure, but also the processes, the procedures, everything that, that we do from a safety and security perspective. So the study that you're seeing, uh, hearing about this evening, um, addresses, addresses all of the things that that we've been talking about. So the scope of the TRC uh, study was on 10 town facilities, which eight of them are buildings, and eight school facilities, which all of them are buildings. So the four, the $4 million debt auth authorization would be addressing um, the scope of the work that uh, was in the study. When the assessment was done, it was designed to consider existing or proposed security systems. And I think it's important to see these are the areas that the assessment looked at. So one area is intrusion detection, which includes your, your security alarm systems. Uh, access control systems, which is uh, entrance into ex both exterior and interior doors. Video surveillance systems are your cameras, both interior and exterior. Uh, the mass notification systems and capabilities, which include the ways that we would be able to communicate out to the community and to the school uh, family population. And then the physical security enhancements, so things that would protect your building envelope. So the study itself took a look at the assessment of all of those areas. I'm going to try to break down this slide. Um, it's a little, bit, a little bit complex, but the study is based on a risk assessment of our facilities. Risk is influenced by the nature and the magnitude of a, of a threat, the vulnerability to that threat, and the consequences that could result from a successful attack. The assessment process that was used is what is called the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency 426 process, which was under the direction of the Department of Homeland Security. This was a, a manual that was developed in 2011. The central part of this effort is the development of what is called a risk matrix, which I will show you later in a, a sample in a later slide. The risk matrix is calculated by multiplying three elements. The first element is what is called the man-made threat score, which looks at the presence, capabilities, and intent of the threat. The second is what is called the importance or criticality of the asset, 
or how important a specific asset or facility is to the mission of the town. And then the third piece is how vulnerable a specific asset or facility is to that threat. When you multiply those three numbers together, you get what is called the risk factor. So the higher the risk score, the more significant the risk is to the facility and to the personnel. And then over, once, once this was a part of the study and what has been happening since the study has been released is that members of the operational team, which uh, Bob mentioned earlier as Lieutenant Abadi, Joe Huggins, Gail Dowd, and the TRC group, have conducted detailed facility evaluations to prioritize what needs to be addressed. Then the risk scores are calculated, and for each asset or function within each of the 18 facilities, and then that determines the prioritization. So here's an example of the FEMA 426 risk matrix. I want to emphasize that this is a sample. Um, it is not connected to any particular Reading uh, facility. Based on the risk scores that I described earlier, each is assigned a color, which I hope you can see. Um, if the score is less than 60, it is considered a low risk, which is labeled green. If the score is between 61 and 175, it is considered a medium risk, which is labeled yellow. If the score is higher than 175, it is considered a high risk, which is labeled red. So obviously, we would like as much green as possible. The recommendations in the security study that, that you have before you this evening for the funding will focus on scores that fall primarily in the high risk or red areas, with the goal of reducing that risk to a category to low risk or green. And obviously, as we know, a lot of things have happened in school safety, town safety in the last 20 years. And situations and threats are constantly evolving. So these risks are going to be continually reviewed for further planning and future planning. The most critical assets and functions are examined as to which would cause the most significant impact to Reading if they were lost or degraded. Then the security measures to protect those assets or functions are considered. Finally, the vulnerability to the threats of these security measures are evaluated. So as these security members, uh, measures are being developed, and this is part of the funding piece, the security measures have at least one of five goals five elements. One is called deter. Deter is intended to make a facility or an asset appear unreachable or beyond the capabilities of the attacker. The second security measure, or the second goal, is detect, which is to allow for an early detection of an attack, either before it occurs or early in the attack sequence. And then a third goal is delay. And delay is to create a physical or psychological barrier to delay access. The funding that is being requested addresses those three areas for security measures. That is the hope, is to hit one of those so that you, don't, you are not put in a situation for respond or for recover. So in terms of the findings of the security study, overall the largest vulnerability that we need to have addressed is what is called access control. And this is a, this is a common issue among public buildings, which is controlling or limiting regulating access to our buildings. Because we are a public building, and because that is the nature of providing services to our community, whether it be town services or whether it be education for our students, um, this is something that obviously is going to require the most attention uh, in the funding. We also, at the same time, even though we have to provide access, we also have to provide a safe and secure environment for our staff and for our students. Where the existing conditions do not meet baseline level of protection, which is the red, as I mentioned earlier, in that matrix, 
The security study is recommending solutions in order to address the threats and vulnerabilities and reduce the risk. So the recommended solutions identified will do the following. One, it's going to address the varying level, levels of criticality. It's going to manage the risk in a cost-effective manner. It's going to track improvements made and a progress towards a baseline level of protection, which is, which is the green area. It's going to, and I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides, something called the operational governance and technical control piece. So there's going to be an integration of the two. And then also, it's going to increase overall situational awareness for personal and physical security. So I want to go a little bit into detail about the operational governance control piece. The operational governance control piece are the policies that we put in place and the implementation of those policies across both town and schools. I think it, what's important to note is because we're looking at 18 facilities, um, some building, mostly buildings, that we want to create a consistency in the way that we plan and operate these. So here are some of the areas that we want to take a look at. First of all, we want to make sure that we have clear, defined roles and responsibilities for staff in from a security standpoint. We want to make sure we have good key management policies, that keys for certain areas are only designated to certain individuals, and that there is a process um, during, through our human resource management when keys are distributed and when they're collected. We want to make sure that proper uh, staff are uh, given alarm codes um, for those that have access uh, with exterior entrance. We want to make sure that we have proper video su surveillance. And I think it's important to note that the video surveillance that is being proposed in the study is for forensic use only. It will not be monitored on a 24-7 basis. We also want to make sure that we have security um, measures in place through, our in, through intrusion detection. We want to maintain, make sure we have strong access control measures, which we said earlier is, is one of the biggest vulnerabilities. Um, that there is proper visitor management systems in place when the public enters um, through either our school or town buildings. That we have a good communication to notify the community of some sort of security issue, whether it be through schools or town. That we have proper drills and procedures in place for active shooter, um, if there's weapons in the workplace, and we, that we have strong protocols in place for termination of employees, that we have shelter in place um, procedures and drills in place, proper evacuation procedures, um, and then other things such as air handling shutdowns, um, infrastructure testing and maintenance, that we make sure that we have proper landscaping and vegetation control around our buildings because, again, that's part of the, the access control piece that we meant earlier. And then that for anyone that is using our facilities, a third party, um, that we have proper procedures in place. So that's really what the operational governance control takes a look at. A very key piece to this, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is the initial and ongoing training in these areas. And as I mentioned in a previous slide, access control is the big piece that, that integrates all of these areas. The technical controls we're not going to be as specific about because really that is what the funding is going to be addressing. It is 20 to the 22 specific areas that are listed, but we cannot share those view as Bob had mentioned earlier. But many of the technical controls are extensions of the operational control policies that I mentioned in the previous slide. And again, as I mentioned earlier, most of the specific security measures that we're going to be addressing in the funding request are due to gaps or lack of access controls. So 
And now I'm going to turn it back over to Bob uh, for the remaining slides. Mr. Lula, sure. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm going to briefly summarize what we have been able to do in the last 18 months once we got the results of the study. Um, <clears throat> the operational governance was certainly easier to tackle. It was policies, not uh, stuff. Um, but we weren't able to tackle all of them because some of them would require capital investment. Um, so these, these are the ones that we can discuss in public. Uh, first, as I mentioned, we have um, formed an, a recommended security governance committee uh, consisting of both those pieces, the operational and managerial uh, security project team. Um, the purpose is we need to develop policies. We've done some. We need to adopt them. That has happened in some instances. Um, and we need to coordinate between the town and the schools. Um, training is, as John mentioned, a very important part of this. Um, just to stop right there, the mission of the schools in the town are quite, op quite opposite in some instances. I think it's generally accepted in the schools. You don't want someone wandering around in the school that doesn't belong there, but that's what a public library is. So the mission of the town and the school buildings are not at all the same in many instances we think in terms of building security. That's a real challenge. We're trying to develop a, a consistent set of policies and approaches, um, but the mission is quite different. Um, we don't want the schools to be unfriendly, but the public does not belong in the schools in this, unless the schools invite them in. Town hall, senior center, library, those are public buildings. The public is supposed to be welcome at all times. Um, so, so it is a bit of a challenge. Um, in terms of key management, and that's the actual physical key, um, that was a cultural change um, that's especially happened in this building. Uh, who has keys? Who's allowed to have keys? Um, as if any of you that work in the public sec or private sector have been through this and um, have, have made a change in building security, it's quite a shock to go from the way you used to be to the way you have to be. Um, back in the 1980s, I worked down on Wall Street. I was through two mergers and acquisitions. So as a result, I, I had friends in almost every place because most of them had been fired. I could walk into any trading floor back in those days without anyone asking me a question. Um, now I could barely get into the lobby without being tackled. Times are just quite different. the things um, on, those, on that policy page run together in this slide. Uh, active shooter, shelter in place, evacuation, and then coordinating drills and training. Um, under the direction of the emergency management director, fire chief, um, Reading does as good a job as this as really anyone in the region does. We go to regular emergency meetings, and um, if you ever sit down with emergency personnel, you would be surprised at how creative they can be, and there is almost no disaster that's actually happened in the world that hasn't been discussed. Um, Reading is acknowledged to be the leader in this. If anything happened in this region, um, all the other communities look to Reading to figure out how to do it, because the one thing we do better than anyone else is we communicate internally very well. All of our departments work together. There's usually 10 or 12 of us that come to these meetings. Most communities have one or two people. So that's something we do well. Um, all these drills are routine to us, um, and we've been doing them for many years. The most recent drill uh, that I was at was an active shooter drill at Killam within the last year. Um, it involved police, fire, and dispatch. It involved John and myself, uh, both school and town management. Uh, and importantly, we also invited other peer communities to come watch, so other town managers or administrators and police chiefs. Um, they were very jealous with what they saw. Um, we weren't introducing ourselves at the scene to each other. We knew each other because we worked together. And, and that's an amazingly simple thing that's very important uh, in these situations. <clears throat> As John mentioned, the other things we, we could do that were at a very low cost is to um, do things I'll just list. New school exterior door locking policies, visitor entrance procedures, and then testing the equipment we do have more often. And at the, at the baseline of much of this, which is really important in addition to training, is increasing everyone's situational awareness. Um, I have one daughter that's very good at this and one that's very bad, so I can sort of understand the challenge of this. Um, the older one cons is consistently amazed how the younger one has no idea what's going on in the world. So to make the students 
really buy into this is going to be a challenge. Um, again, we have strong collaboration not only inside the organization but outside. Um, we have a good relationship with the STARS program, with NEMLEC. These are regional emergency management systems. We have a memo of understanding between the schools, police, and the Middlesex DA. We have community-based justice meetings. Our CASA, you know, is our substance of use um, a coalition. We have two school resource officers. And the school has excellent safety plans. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the school's mission is fairly clear, to keep people out of the building that aren't supposed to be there. Um, we've done a poor job in our policies because we have a different mission and we're not exactly quite sure <laughs> what the policy should say other than there should be secure areas of each building where the public is not welcome, for instance, uh, payroll. Um, to conclude, um, we have done some additional low-cost policy work needed in our buildings especially, but we're really now at a decision point. We've done almost all we can do for free. We're now at the point where we need to understand whether or not this body will grant capital funding. Um, and there's a question that has come up as to whether this would be the first of many asks. Um, the honest answer is one never knows. But certainly, as I stand here today, I don't plan to ask for any more money in building security for as long as I'm here. That doesn't mean that technology won't change and opportunities won't change. But this is not some secret plan to go two and three times down the road and ask you for more. One of the reasons I have said that a future uh, request might come to this body is because grant funding might become available. There is nothing today that is certain. Uh, but in the House budget, there's a small amount, $75,000, that one of our reps has put in. Our senator is committed to also do 75 or 100,000. And then there's two different pools of money um, which could be accessible to us in a year. We're told it's not the summer, but it could be in a year, and that could be in the millions of dollars, or, or say, a single million dollars. If, this, if we decide we need to do more than four million, and that's a big if, it could be more grant funding. But town meeting would have to authorize us to accept the grant and make the project bigger. If grant funding becomes available, we may well decide four million is fine, we don't need any more, we'll just spend less than four million. But just to recap, <clears throat> this body has provided 625,000 for the project so far. The request immediately in front of you is $4 million of debt authorization. And I'm telling you it's very likely we'll ask for another 400,000 of capital to be moved up. It was already in the capital plan, it was planned in 2022, uh, but it could be asked for much sooner. Um, that would, if you want to round it all up, that's about a $5 million project. Um, could we spend more? Yes. Could we spend less? Yes. Um, what's this number? It was a comfortable number based on the green, red, yellow chart that, that John showed you and what um, the consultant report said in terms of the most critical things we really should fix. Um, we don't have as an objector an objective, and it's just not cost effective to change all the yellows to green, or even all the reds to green. We want to take care of the real serious issues that we saw in the study, um, and just make sure we lock those down. Thank you. Uh, FinCom report, Mr. Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It's certainly unusual for the Finance Committee to review a spend of this magnitude with just summary level information. And so we had to adjust our evaluation framework a little bit and answer, in essence, two questions. Number one, is the spend consistent with the goal of the community? I think it's undoubtedly yes. And the second is, was the process um, rigorous and thoughtful? And we believe there that the answer is yes as well. Um, there's no additional operating costs. Um, you just heard the town manager say we expect it's a one-time ask. And so at our meeting on April 29th, uh, the Finance Committee voted 5 to 0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. <coughs> Bill Brown, precinct 8. Uh, Bob, are the two water towers involved in this security? I still ask. Hmm. Without? We, we have 10 facilities and eight buildings. Okay. So they might be. Okay. Uh, I would suggest that if anybody wanted to 
uh, set this town on its rear end very quickly, those would be the most vulnerable. And I very seriously doubt there's as much we could do if some fanatic wanted to go by with a rocket launcher and knock a boat out. We'd be without water for a heck of a long time. And I've had that incident once, and I don't want to be again. Further discussion? I do want to remind town meeting that at this point, the seller of land is not watching, but a lot of other people might be. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. A uh, quick question. To what degree, if any, was the Permanent Building Committee involved in all this um, planning? Because we're talking about a $4 million plus project. Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we asked them very early on, and they declined any interest because this is not, this is not specifically construction of a building. Um, in the last two months, they've reconsidered on this and Turf 2 and some other projects uh, to give the facilities director some assistance if he should wish it. But they said very clearly this project is not in their mission statement. First question. Yes, over here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Weaver, Precinct 6. I have a question, that, a logistical question that might not have an answer at this time. The video surveillance cameras, I'm assuming those will be digital. Has any thought been put into how that's going to be stored, whether it's going to be on a server or on drives internally? Mr. Lillisher. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and has that been incorporated into the, the cost estimate? Yes, it has. Okay, thank you. Yes, right on the ass. Mr. Uh... Rook. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. Just a few questions. Uh, so, Bob, in terms of any benchmarking available, I assume other towns and schools and so forth are doing this. Were we able to leverage some of the work they're doing or might be thinking of? Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, a couple things. One is if you're going to build a new school today and you want funding from the SBA, the certain requirements from a security standpoint you must incorporate in design. So that's part of what the project we're doing. Um, that may seem like an aside, but we have not found any town or any community in Massachusetts that's doing what we're asking to do. We found them much more building-based. You're fixing this building. While we're at it, we may as well do X, Y, Z. Right. Um, for the library building that we just completed, we did um, do some design work that would allow for very simple security measures to be added. Um, for older buildings such as Town Hall, that work clearly was never done. So there is, there is no easy benchmark in Massachusetts that we have for this. Okay. Uh, and I know you can't divulge the details, but it, just at the high level, so for $4 million, you know, I think about it in terms of labor, a headcount, uh, you know, hardware technology, and you know, the soft cost policies, procedures, I, I'm just, uh, just roughly, I mean, is there a lot of technology that gets included in that? Or is, a, is, is there a lot of head count or just any kind of a directional comment? Mr. If you don't mind, I could just keep talking. Sure. And ask. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, first of all, as, as Eric mentioned, there is no ongoing costs, operational costs. Aside from maintenance that the facilities department would need to do on equipment, which is, as far as we know, nominal. So it's, there's no personnel costs. This is all one-time capital. Um, there will be project management, design costs. The actual stuff we're doing um, is going to have two pieces. It's going to have construction as a significant part, especially in the dispatch center, and then uh, security measures, I guess I'll call them. Um, I can just say that the security measures piece will be the substantial amount of the $4 million and not the other costs. Okay. And does it address, I guess I'm trying to visualize as a sort of a separate risk or threat is the whole, you know, IT, cyber, you know, security issue. So is that part of this whole effort? Um, no, it really is not. Um, we have, we take care of that anyways with school and town IT. Um, but like with any threat, I, I've asked our IT director if he'd be willing to challenge the high school students to a hackathon, and he still says no. Okay. Um, we're always vulnerable. We always will be. Yep. You see other municipalities that are held up for $250 and their stuff locked up until they pay. We're always vulnerable. This, this is not to address um, technology security, but technology will be part of the solution, absolutely. 
And that's um, one of the reasons for the work in the dispatch center, a lot of that's technology. Good, and my last question was around the, uh, the risk matrix, so I was trying to understand if that was a qualitative sort of approach, so did the committee get together and sort of make their own estimate in terms of vulnerabilities and, so, and you know, the other factors that go into that calculation, or is it best on, best on some, based on some hard criteria where you go in and collect some data and, the, you know, the answer comes out? Um, TRC spent literally months walking through every building with the facilities department. Um, I was told the facilities department actually learned a few things on that tour, spending so much time in the building. Um, TRC then did all this work completely independently. Uh, they gathered data from all the buildings, they cranked it through their model, and this is what they came up. We didn't have input into that. Okay, good. Good. I, uh, support, I think it's critical, urgent, and, you know, very important. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Duxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let me see if I can use the microphone well today. Um, first, thanks for, for the great work done here. A, a couple of um, comments and then a, a question if I could. So on the, on the comment side, um, as was brought up a little bit earlier, it would be very helpful, I think, for town meeting and probably for the boards to get this information a little bit earlier and not kind of at the night of the presentation. So just kind of a general comment. It would just help everybody, I think, to absorb and digest what's going on a little bit better. Um, second on the comment from uh, Mr. O'Rourke from before in terms of best practices, um, I did a little homework to see what was happening at places like Newtown um, and how they're running process. And one of the things that was highlighted there is something that I would encourage us to consider. It's a very community-centric involvement process, meaning some of the things obviously have to be top-down, understood, and where some of the changes are being proposed obviously is not stuff that we should know. But the community gets very involved in the process in dealing with how uh, a lot of these actions are taken. And if you look at kind of in the presentation, a lot of it is how law enforcement and other groups are handling it, facilities are handling it, which is great. But I think the community needs to be involved as well in terms of understanding if something happens, how is it going to move forward? Um, and to get some expectations set and things like that. And the Newtown, I'll, I'll forward this to everybody, but Newtown was very clear on this. And in fact, they've been doing surveys around the country of how other groups are handling security in schools. And this is one of the big conclusions that they've been coming to. Um, one of the questions, or the question, I guess, is uh, in this presentation, you talk about monitoring progress in November. I'm wondering if you, you can share a little bit about um, how will get updated. Usually when this body is, is working on a $4 million project, you know, we're able to get very clear updates on progress and other activities. Here it's going to be a lot harder, clearly. But how, how will we know how things are going? Uh, not at a building specific level, but how do we understand how things are moving ahead, that things are on track, the activities are, are focused and, and planned, um, and kind of where, I guess, where we are in the process. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Lelager. Um, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, TRC is actually the firm that's doing work on, on the post Sandy Hook uh, issue. Um, I say this with all due respect, they are spending significantly more money than we are for their past issues. Um, we are only looking to, again, correct the red issues into yellow, um, and, and that's why the issues have been, if you will, held by the uh, staff during the day and not had a community involvement. Um, the update, it's, it's hard to know what the update will say. Um, we spent a great deal of time looking at this presentation as to what is the most we could say without saying too much. The same thing is going to happen for November town meeting. We are expecting schematic design. Um, I'm not certain, but I think at that point we'll have a much better idea of cost estimates. If we have a problem, we'd certainly tell you. Um, there is a base of work we insist on doing. I don't foresee any problem with that being done, but until you go out to bid, you just don't know. So any kind of um, information we'd have on the cost of the project, we could share. Um, we'd also be able to share what grant funding is available. At that point, we'll at least know what the state budget has for us, if anything. And as I mentioned, um, we are very likely to ask for that radio um, capital item to be moved up. Um, it's, it's really difficult in this project to be very specific. 
Um, I talked to one of the elected members uh, during the last week about a sample project budget. It was one that use, we used for the library build. And the answer was, that's not detailed enough. I, I was thinking, I understand what you're saying, but that's what we used for a very public project. And it seemed to fit the appetite for that. So there's no question that if you want ex extreme detail in this project, you will be unhappy. You will not get it. It will not be public. Um, but summary level detail, certainly. And then once a project is actually uh, under construction, you'll certainly get those updates. Um, that's something we shared uh, frequently with the library building committee um, at the time. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Doctor? Nancy, Dr. Precinct, uh, one, uh, two things. One, um, could you give a little bit more information regarding privacy issues around the videotaping? Who else it would have access to any of the video surveillance, other outside agencies? So you're talking from a forensic standpoint? Uh, every, every viewpoint you can think of. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? No, I'm just curious because you're going to have uh, videotapes. I guess I'm wondering who else has access to this and what other agencies outside of the Reading Police Department would have access to that? For right now, it would just be the officers and the dispatchers that would have access to their videotapes. If it was a forensic, and obviously the district attorney's office, or any state or federal agency after an incident that would need access to it for an investigation. Okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm just... No, no, okay. I just know that, but that that's, okay. that's fair. And then the second is more of a concern I have, and I don't quite know how um, you would address this. You know, you've hired security experts, and I guess going forward, my concern professionally is I've actually, unfortunately, have seen children in my private practice uh, as a mental health professional who, you know, the adolescent who now is having panic attacks from a lockdown drill, or the elementary school child who now has school phobia. So I guess I'm wondering, is there some way of getting some input from some psychiatric consultants about how you have drills and how you prepare the children, but allow some of that subpopulation to be protected. I'm going to give this to Dr. Doherty yes. if that's okay. And I'll take my answer from you, but I, I really would like that address, you know, address only because I'm surprised, but I am seeing the aftermath of the impact of these drills having on um, children who already have an underlying disorder. It's Dr. Doherty. That's a legitimate, legitimate point. Can I, I want to go back to the first question for a second, Nancy, so that from a school perspective. So if the school administrators and district administrators have access to the uh, surveillance camera if it's in the schools as well? Just that answers your first question. In terms of the second question, when we, we were one of the first communities um, in the region to put in um, the active shooter drills, which we use the ALICE method. There are a few methods out there. They all pretty much follow the same process and procedures. The first thing we did when we went through those procedures is we developed um, developmentally appropriate ways um, to do the drills for K to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 12. So for example, in K to 2, we have social stories that we use rather than you know, talk about active shooters or um, something that would, you know, create more anxiety. So we've been very careful when we've been implementing our drills uh, to make it very developmentally age appropriate. Um, we also are in constant contact with our school-based counselors to make sure that we are not doing anything that would not be appropriate for that age student. But we can certainly look in to see um, if there are other ways we can look at do it differently as well. For the discussion, Ms. O'Neill. Um, 
Leon O'Neill, Precinct 4. I see that your project manager for the library is one that you um, hired for this one. And it brings to mind one of the concerns that I've had that I'm actually extremely dismayed and rather shocked hasn't been addressed, and that's the physical security of the library. And theres I don't think there's any of the town buildings that I can think of, or even any of our retail, that is less protected than the front entrance to the library. So we have a glass entranceway at the ground level with no stair or curbing or anything, and the drop-off box to the right of the entrance. On numerous occasions, people drive straight up to the, within feet of that door and park and get out and put books, you know, maybe just a couple of books into that drop-off. But it's, to me, it's an obvious and very egregious example of uh, <clears throat> the vulnerability of any car with slips intentionally or unintentionally likely uh, would slip on wet pavement or snow or someone hits the wrong pedal and would either hit someone or hit the door. So I'm, I can't believe that I've raised this um, <clears throat> at least by last spring to people you know, associated with that building. I can't understand why that isn't already fixed. Mr. Lalasher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Marilyn, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, as someone who was responsible for that project, I stepped in about halfway and made as many improvements as I could, and that was not one of them. Um, the library community is very welcoming. Um, they were not willing to put security first in a few areas. So um, we did what we could, but that's not something that we didn't know about or predict. Um, and absolutely you've hit on something that we've talked about with public safety in terms of improving that main entrance, whether it's bollards or whether it's a higher curb or what have you. It's, it's just an invitation for a problem with too many things coming together at once, so I couldn't agree with you more. Further discussion? Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, so just a little bit of history here. So I'm a, I work in the medical industry, and so when I saw this, the first thing I thought was FMEA, which is failure modes and effect analysis. Um, but the reason that kind of triggered me is that in that industry, after you do a risk assessment and you make your mitigations, you're normally required, certainly by the FDA and other, other um, standards organizations, to uh, update that over the time. So it's so, okay, you made a change. Well, did it actually reduce the risk? Did you actually make the change and did it have the impact that you thought? Um, now granted, that's a post-project activity, um, but is that something that's also planned? Or is that something that, I mean, you've you know, talked about not wanting to come back for more activities, but in some respects, that's an integral part of the whole process is to know, well, did your change actually really make an impact? Mr. Lillisher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's a really hard question to answer because we hope to never know the answer if you really think about it. Um, what we're doing is much more likely to require updating and change on the policy level, on the non-financial capital items. Um, I'll give you an example. In the vocational school in Wakefield, um, you used to get buzzed in and you had to walk down a long hallway and then you had to take a right and find the central office. What if you took a left? What if you went straight? I could have gone anywhere in that building. Now they have a desk right out front with someone staffing it. I don't know if it's an employee or a volunteer. You can't get more than 10 feet inside that building before they know who you are and where you're going. You know, aside from the employee, and I don't know the cost of that employee or volunteer, that was a low cost change. Those are the kinds of things we will be looking at always and learning from. The actual physical improvements to the building, I don't think as much fit into that category. Yeah, oh, okay, I mean, there may be circumstances where you make changes that you know, have you know, assessing effective communication. So you've said, okay, we're gonna implement some, just some, some town-wide communication where you know that, okay, did you reach everybody? Did you, I mean, there may be some things that you could actually be collecting over time to help determine did you actually meet that objective. I, I certainly understand the, kind of the, the far end of the spectrum is not something that we wanna be counting by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I guess the, just the intent, obviously, is we recognize that doing this once is not an adequate assessment. I mean, technology changes, threats changes, but you also are making assumptions that the changes you've made have, in fact, affected those particular risks, and 
you don't really know that until you actually implement them. I mean, that's kind of the premise of the whole of the whole risk assessment process. So, but anyhow, all right, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. Um, this is a, by appearance, is a very extremely um, diligent um, process that you went through looking at building, really looking both at the process level and um, also operationally hardware things to do. Um, and that number $4 million has been kind of, we talked about that really now for a couple of years. And so um, I know I've sat in, an, in, in enough meetings with you, Bob, to know that you like to do things, especially ask for what you need for right away and don't keep coming back for more. And, and then you kind of reiterated that tonight when you said that, that you don't really plan on doing that. So my question is, you know, Obviously, you can't tell us what's going to be in there, but obviously you made some decisions or the committee made some decisions about sort of where to draw the line um, at, at $4 million. I, so a couple of things. A, how did that number come up about? Uh, come about? Was it set by like, okay, we're gonna, we want to get X amount of reds to yellows, X amount of yellows to green? Um, and then also kind of what's not on there? So in other words, if we spent $4.5 million, you know, would we get more? yellows to green. Um, and, and so I think it's important, especially because we can spend $40 million and never have 100% guarantee that we're going to be safe, you know, that, 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 that we mitigate all the risk. But is $4 million enough? And if we do a little bit more, you know, would we, would we get more? And I know you can't really answer the question without telling us what we're getting. But I think the gist of my question is, um, how much more safety could we purchase if we did a little bit more? And do you feel confident that that $4 million is enough? <laughs> Mr. Lillisher. The marginal cost is higher than the marginal benefit. Um, you can be sure that if once we go out to bid that there's any concern at all that we have not hit the minimum that we need to hit, we will be back and we will ask for more money or we will scrap the project. Um, but the four million um, is above that number right now, and, and again, until you go out for bid, you just you just don't know. Um, we've seen a whole variety of projects. Uh, one that's come in at 33 percent of what we thought, and one that's come in at 200 percent. So you just don't know. Um, it was arrived at by the two groups of people that you saw, uh, the seven people total, in addition to a lot of discussion with TRC, the expert. It was a cost-effective use of the money. Um, that's kind of the Reading way. We just we all can't help think that way. Could we have gotten, you know, more safety done for another million dollars? Of course we could, but we drew the line where we thought it was cost effective is the fairest way I can say. But as reality sets in, that line, if it moves, we have to tell you. Uh, have we spoken yet, Ms. Ms. Hillary? Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. I would just like to reiterate my thanks to uh, Dr. Doherty and Mr. Lelesher for making this the highest priority. I fully support this article. And as a town meeting member whose precinct includes not only children, but municipal employees, community members who use all of these buildings, uh, there's no question that the high cost of this endeavor is not something we should it's not something that I um, feel is unreasonable, given the world we live in, and I believe there are times we should defer to the experts. I do want to go back to a point that Mr. Doxer made about community involvement, and I heard talk about making students aware of situations. I agree with Mr. Doxer about making community members also aware of situations. And one specific example, in my children's school, we're told not to hold the door for anyone behind us, that we are to enter and then close the door. And that feels rude and unkind, but as parents, we all understand the rationale behind that. But I'm not sure that there's a larger community education about that particular issue. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to share that, but thank you again, and I support this. Further discussion? Uh, Ms. Webb? Thank 
Keely and Webb, Precinct 1, um, also a chair of the school committee. I just want to inform town meeting that um, members of the school committee, um, some of the current members um, participated or attended the first session, executive session in 2017, and all of the current members of the school committee were at the um, most recent session. And just sort of let people know that while we don't talk about in our school committee meetings, uh, at every meeting we don't talk specifically about safety, we focus on, uh, we're focusing on the academics and the learning and what we need to do to create the environment for students to learn effectively and optimize the time with their uh, teachers. Uh, of course, students have to be healthy to learn. They have to be um, emotionally feel safe and they have to physically feel safe. And so um, certainly it's a priority for us in the schools and it's the way that we're going to make sure that we educate students who can then go on to higher education and careers where they can be productive. So I just want to emphasize that for people and uh, there was no vote by the committee on this uh, particular article, it just that wasn't the nature of what we were doing. Um, but I believe the committee members all prioritize safety as does the superintendents and would just like to say thank you. Um, I know it's been an enormous amount of work and I know Dr. Darty and uh, Town Manager Lala Shore are up there, but uh, Joe Huggins and our CFO Gail Dowd and Kevin Kabuzi have put in enormous amounts of hours on this, so appreciate it. And um, certainly, I personally look forward to supporting this article. For the discussion, yes, and the yes. Thank you, Caitlin Mercurio, Precinct Two. Um, I'm a mom of three, and as many of you know, because I've spoken to so many of you about it, this very literally keeps me up at night. I support safety, I support security, um, but I also recognize that when we add security, we have to lose a little bit of something, and that's our privacy. Um, and I don't know that I'm entirely comfortable with the people being monitored being left out of the decision making. I understand the sensitive security information. My question for you is, would you be willing to open up a spot on the committee, on your inner security committee, um, for either a member of town meeting or a member of the general community? Mr. Lillisher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. The answer is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andy Friedman, Precinct 4, Select Board. Um, first, thank you to um, all the members that developed this plan under the process that you chose to use. Uh, I was impressed by the presentations that I have heard. The uh, most recent executive session we came out of, I was convinced that this was a great idea. Uh, I would also like to say that I am a strong proponent of uh, improving security for our buildings, especially for our children. Uh, that said, I have two comments on um, this article number. The f first is that I wonder if the 2002 Homeland Security Act, which was written in response to the 9-11 attacks, is the, a federal act, is, is the appropriate mechanism to discuss and promote safety in our town. I agree with Mr. Doxter that a more community-based discussion uh, would be more appropriate than an anti-terrorism act. And the other question or the other concern that I have is, is that they talked about the risk, they presented the, the, the risk assessment very well, and I do risk assessments all day at work. Um, and what I understand about risk assessments is that um, it's an important the inputs are extremely important to the answer. And in this case, many of the factors that go into this risk assessment, um, either we don't know 
or carry a lot of value judgment, judgment with them. And those value judgments, I think, it would be more appropriate for members of the community to weigh in um, to determine how we value various things in town and what we want to spend our money most on and where we spend our money. So I guess to wrap up, I, I, it's, it, it'll be difficult for me to defend a yes vote on this to cons my constituents when I really don't know the specifics of how much we're spending and where. I don't need to know all the details that would tip our hand, but it is difficult for me to support something when uh, so much of this came out of a black box and a need-to-know basis. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Peter Brown, Precinct 8. Apparently, I have a lot to say tonight. I'm uh, struggling at the moment because I'm quite upset. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll try to explain why. I, I agree with a lot of what Mr. Friedman was getting at. Um, but first, let me ask uh, Dr. Doherty a couple of questions, if I might. Uh, weapons in the workplace, that was on the slide. What, what does that mean to us? Dr. How Dr. can we translate that? Is that, well, is, oh. go ahead. In, in schools, there are no weapons allowed in the workplace. Yes. There's actually a state law that does not allow it. And there's no discussion about arming teachers or no. anything like that? No. Okay, great. Thank you. That clarifies that. Um, Sorry if I, no, 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 that's if I good. gave you a different impression. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just wasn't sure what it meant because we can't really talk about it. And that's the <laughs> ultimate irony, and I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, I'm, a four -year, I'm, a, I'm a fourth grader. Uh, I'm going to walk up to, you know, one of the one of my school, am I going to notice that the entranceway is somehow um, significantly different in terms of maybe feeling like I'm going to be walking into uh, my school and I'm going to have to do something that's different, and maybe it's it's going to be a little bit upsetting to me. Is that a possibility? Could could the entrances change to the extent that? Um, you know, there's going to be much more security for students entering the building. I think an answer too, but <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lelisher. Um, yeah, thank you, Ms. Moderator. Um, the best the best example I have is, uh, as a Barrows parent, um, when the doors used to open outside, you had direct access to the playground. Kids went in and out. Adults could go in and out, and then the access became centralized through one or two doors. Mm -hmm. That was an enormous cultural change within that school. What we're proposing to do from Capital Project is nothing even remotely close to that change that a, that a student or a child would notice, no. But something's going to change about the doors. Because well, I'm going to list. try to be specific but be general at the same time. Sure. Okay. What we're proposing with the funding is to improve what we already have in place. Yeah. And this is not a Cadillac that, that, that is going to be funded. We are improving what we have already in place. And we are enhancing areas that we are very vulnerable in. As a student, I think you, it, it, the day-to-day -day operations of the school are going to continue the way they are now. Um, that we're still going to have drills. We're still going to make this a very high priority. We're going to do some of the things that, you know, like don't let anyone in behind you from an exterior door. You know, don't, in, don't open the door. Um, let, let them go to the main door. You know, those types of things that we already do. But we're, we're, the, the purpose of the funding is to improve and make more consistent across town and school buildings what we already have in place and enhance some areas that are in the red. 
Okay, that, that's reassuring to me. To, to Mr. Berman's point, you, you, you know, you're recommending $4 million, and $4 million will seem like a drop in the bucket, if anything, close to what happened at Marjorie, you know, Stoneham Douglas oh, School happens. It's going gonna, it's gonna to seem completely insufficient. So it's hard to, to know whether or not four million is sufficient or maybe six million is more prudent if we can't really talk about some of the details. And I really do question this con... I, I, it, it strikes me that I don't, I, I just don't understand why we're talking about this as a national security issue or a local security issue instead of, a, to, to Mr. Friedman's point, that it's a community issue where, you know, obviously everyone in this room, you know, would, cares the utmost for, for their kids and the security of their kids. And we need to talk about that as a community. Bill, Bill. Bill Brown, uh, please. How many, please, how, Mr. Brown? Well, this, this last, please last, direct your question. Yeah, uh, to yes, me, to I'm, me, this yes. is the last point. Do not direct your question to other members. Uh, please direct them to who, the body. Who can tell me how many? Uh, what was was when was the first town meeting in Reading? We were there. Ser serious question. When did we? When did town meetings start in Reading? 1644. No. Uh, okay. We've been having town meeting for. 375 years? Yeah? Correct. <laughs> what, the strength of the fact that we're standing here today is because we've been able to talk about issues openly. That is the strength of our community. That is the strength of our country. To the extent that we continue uh, to believe that somehow we're going to be made more secure by not being able to discuss things in an open way is contradictory to that idea. Thank you. Further discussion? Well, I'm, I want to get town meeting members first. Um, well, she's in, yep, if you want to be called, you need to be in front of the line. Okay. I just couldn't sit anymore. Alicia Williams, Precinct 8. Um, we can spend $4 million. We can take, spend $10 million. What it comes down to is we need to make sure that our basic security is looked at. And are we, we're going forwards. Are we also looking behind us and making sure that even the basic level of security at the schools is being handled? My second question is, with in terms of the video, the policies, are we revising our policies for video? Um, child gets bullied. Parents want to see the tape. Are there already policies in place? Are we revising those? Dr. Dowdy. So part of the study was to take a look at current policy. I'm, I'm answering your first question. Uh, was to take a look at current policies, things that we weren't doing well, things that we needed to improve in. So the answer to your question, yes, we are looking backwards as much as we're looking <laughs> forward. Um, in terms of, there, there is already policy in place in terms of video surveillance. Um, just so that everyone was aware, and this is, this is known, um, there are certain areas we cannot have cameras in. Right. We cannot have cameras in bathrooms, we cannot have cameras in locker rooms, we actually cannot have cameras in classrooms. So the areas that we have cameras are the public areas of our schools, um, and I can't speak for the town, but I'm speaking just from a cool school perspective right now. And what is the policy if there's an issue between students and there's a fight and parents want to see it because there's a lawsuit? Is there a policy on that? That, that video is not available to parents. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. So we're on the side. Yes. Uh, Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. I, I think this is a no-brainer. Um, and to the point, a while back during the, the racial graffiti episodes our, our town unfortunately went through. Um, if you're on the Reading Parents Network, there's people out there ready to hang kids, punish the whole, let's punish every single student until someone talks, whatever. This is a mean to that ends. I motion to end debate. I cannot take that from someone who oh. has been speaking. Further discussion? Sorry. Um, we've already spoken. Anybody who has not spoken, who's up on the back there? Oh, uh, Ms. Sekra? 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Demetra Sekras, Precinct 4. Um, Superintendent Doherty, first, thank you all for this. I uh, also have big concerns about the process, but also big concerns about why we're having the process. Um, I guess what I want to know is, are schools going to feel like prisons? And are you, I need to address what was just brought up because it is my understanding that when kids are in school, they can do big, you know, bad things. But I would hate to feel that I was paying for surveillance, which was then using, being used to end something like graffiti or vaping or whatever other horrible little things that people do. Am, am I making sense? I mean, is yeah. this about ending bad behavior of children or is this, okay. No. I not just need to hear that No, said. no, not at all. And to answer your other question, schools are not going to be prisons. So, uh, it, that I, and I think I was trying to answer that with Mr. Brown's question. I don't believe students are going to notice anything different. Okay. I hope they're going to feel safer and um, more secure. And um, parents will it, sleep better at night. Yes, but and, and this was this is not has nothing to do with trying to catch students, you know, doing bad things. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Well, Ms. Borowski. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jean Borowski, Precinct 6, also a member of the school committee. Um, as a taxpayer and a resident and a town meeting member and as a school committee member, I really do applaud this process. I am persuaded that the right people were in the room. If we're going to have a discussion about building security, I want town leadership there, I want school leadership there, I want facilities there. I certainly want our leadership of public safety in that room. So I'm persuaded that the process was the right process and we brought in experts in security as well. So I feel like the right people were in the room. Um, so sort of from an intellectual governance standpoint, I'm comfortable with this. There's an emotional element for me. I am a parent of two children in the Reading Public Schools. Um, so as a parent, I implore you to support this. I implore you to support this. And not just because I drop my kids off at the Reading Public Schools every day, um, but a lot of us have, have students who are tween and teen age utilize the library. And they're at the age where we drop them off at the library to attend the event, to attend the workshop or the course. Um, so this goes beyond the schools. I'm thrilled that the, it's a highly collaborative um, attempt to be consistent across municipal and school buildings while, as Mr. Lalasher said, recognizing a difference in function. Um, so that's another aspect of this process I'm comfortable with. It is going to require trust from all of us, no doubt about it. We're not going to get access to the information we would like, I would like. We are going to have to have that leap of faith and that trust in the people who we know and many of us have known for years are doing this work. I have that trust um, and I would encourage you to think about what failure to fund this could potentially look like because that's the downside would be the failure to fund it. So this has my full and um, enthusiastic support. For the discussion, yes over here. Mr. Herrick. Uh, Steve Herrick, uh, Precinct 8. Um, Bob, you said something earlier that um, sort of stuck with me a little bit. I just want to make sure I understand that, pulling that thread a little bit. You said that if it sounds like we are not working off of quotes, we are working off of estimates for the $4 million. That's how that was arrived at based on the professional inputs received thus far. Uh, it sounded like to me like you said if we needed more than that, we would either come back to this body and vote for additional um, funding, or we'd find it in free cash, or we would scuttle the project. The implication of that being that this is kind of an all-or-nothing thing. Is is it really thus? I mean, is this a scalable project? Could we could we approve two million dollars and still get some security, and then more with three, and more with five, and more with ten? Or is it we're looking at a system that we've estimated at four million dollars that kind of encompasses all of these various things? I know there were a number of things, physical barriers and stuff like that, but to me, it sounds like the heart and soul of this system. It's largely there's a lot of electronics involved, involving door access and video cameras and all those kinds of things. 
Am I thinking about this the right way? Is it scalable or is it really more of an all or nothing type deal? Mr. Lou Asher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm glad you pointed out something I said I didn't explain it thoroughly. Um, if you think back to um, five fields and lighting the Birch Meadow area, um, we got bids and we can only light three of the fields in the priority order that the select board picked. We chose to cancel the whole thing. It was entirely scalable. We could have done three fields, but it's not what this body voted on. So in that spirit, we'd come back to you and we couldn't give you the details of three fields versus five, but we'd say, the bids came in and we can't do the project that we told you. To, to, cost, uh, to do that project might cost a half a million dollars more or whatever, and give you the final word on, we can certainly spend four million effectively, but again, it was what we expected. So it's not all or none, but I think you should have the right to say all or none. Except we don't know exactly what to expect because we don't have those details. Yeah, that's, that's going to be tricky, but yes, we'll have to think of a way to explain. Okay. I, I have one more uh, comment, or I guess it's a question here too. Um, when we think of a lot of the other really horrible situations, uh, some of the other school tragedies, that seems to be the focus of, I think, most people's worries here. Um, a lot of them are not terroristic in the sense that they come from outside. Um, at, they're at work what we would call an insider threat. Um, a lot of these are actually um, people within the community, people potentially even within the student body. So you put a list of things up on that operational governance, or I can't remember what the wording was. You listed a bunch of things. And to me, one of the most important things, and maybe it fits, there's a code word there that signals it. Um, we talked about how the community needs to be involved in this, and I think that more than electronics and cameras and all these other things we're talking about, I think that one of the key aspects of security in schools has to do with sort of the softer side of reaching out to and identifying students who have potentially emotional problems, alienation, things like that. And I want to know, I'm sure there is activity taking place at this level. Uh, does anything in this $4 million plan seek to address those kinds of things, or is that another discussion? Dr. Darty. The behavioral health piece has been part of our district improvement plan for the last three years. So that is, that is work that we have been ongoing and doing. It is not part of this project. This, this project is focused on um, capital, infrastructure, um, things like that. Um, there are things that we have been doing on the behavioral health side that we, w contributes to the psychological safety of our students and also making sure that our students have connections to adults and other students in the building so that if there is a problem, they feel like they can reach out. Was that something that was part of the risk assessment that was performed by our consultants? No, it wasn't. But that's something we had been doing. We had done our own assessment of those needs prior to this. I see. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Um, People have not yet spoken. Uh, Mr. O'Neill. <laughs> oh, it wasn't. Um, excuse me. Sorry, they've been trying to get me up here. John Breslin, Precinct 3. I had two questions regarding the technology. Will the hardware and infrastructure costs of the project be known through public bids? And also, will replacement, repair, maintenance of the systems and components be supported by the annual budget without additional funding needs? Sure. Um, I don't honestly know the answer. Maybe someone else does to your first question. Um, the second question, as it stands right now um, on an ongoing maintenance basis, it should be absorbed in the current budget. But certainly if it comes to replacing capital, for instance, you'll see that in the capital plan over whatever period of time you would need to see it. But we're not adding people. We're not adding significant ongoing expenses, just you know, some minor maintenance. The first piece, I don't really know what will be public and not in the um, certainly construction will be public, um, but the technology, I'm just not as sure, quite honestly. No, do you know, Joe? All right. So there will be a Chapter 149 component of the project, which is the actual construction piece, which would be for dispatch and any of the work we do in the buildings. And like Bob mentioned, any of the technology piece, that's the way we're sort of structuring this to get the, um, the best pricing, if you will, 
is to split it like that so that we have a chapter 149 piece and then a technology component. So I'm not sure how much detail we could get into as far as what was put into it because I'm sure there'll be um, people that pull bids that we qualify that can bid on the project are going to be, it's going to be a, a small group of contractors that would be bidding on the technology side because it is building security. Yeah. Discussion among people who have not yet been called on? Ms. Binder? Angela Binder, Precinct 5. Um, I came tonight not knowing what to expect with, with not very much information being given out. And I actually got a few phone calls today asking me to vote against this because um, people feel like there hasn't been very much information and they don't know what it's about and it's a lot of money. I feel much more reassured after having seen the presentation and I completely support this. Um, I do have a few comments though. Um, one was what was brought up pre by the previous speaker about um, the scope of security and a little surprised to see the term homeland security. And I was wondering, um, a lot of security breaches, a lot of things that go, not a lot, things that go on. You mentioned what happened in Danvers a few years ago um, and the tragic death of a teacher and that was by a student who had a box cutter, so didn't, you know, was okay to be in there, didn't have a weapon, and there was actually, um, they had put in video cameras, but it turns out that they weren't surveilling them, and like you said, it was for, for forensic purposes only, so is that, would that be the same situation, so the video cameras would not be monitored, they'd be used for, and I guess, I, I don't know where it comes up, whether it's part of the student awareness part, people being aware of their surroundings, but I just, everything that I've seen seems like you're preparing for a big terrorist attack or a, a big event. And I would just hope that these other events that are just as tragic are also included. And then a, another point, um, I, I've heard I've heard elected body members talk about we shouldn't make decisions after 10 o'clock. So I really wish that this had come up before 9.30 because it's now quarter of 11 and it seems like a very important decision and everybody should really be aware when they're making it. So, um, but I do, I do support this and I do um, hope that the community is involved more going forward in whatever capacity they could be. Dr. Doughty. So just to comment, uh, the, um, the, uh, the FEMA process was one part of the study. It also looked at situations like the Danvers situation, okay. school shootings, um, community uh, shootings, things like that. So it, that was just one piece and it was, the FEMA process is for, for looking at your infrastructure in existing buildings, okay. which is where the risk matrix <laughs> came up. Thank you. Further discussion among those who have not yet been called on? Ms. No Doctor? Linda Snow Doctor, I'm a resident, Precinct 1, also a school committee <coughs> member. Um, being responsible but not having all the information is really uncomfortable. But in this case, I'm very cognizant that those people in this room are not the only people watching. We're not the only people listening. The information doesn't stop here. We have social media. There aren't controls. And I recognize that the information is very vital to protect. We give all our vulnerabilities away, then we create new ones. And I really appreciate all the work that has been done to prepare this. It's not, um, we've relied on experts to come up with this program. Our representatives and our staff, our employees have worked hard to bring the Reading side of it. It's all, not all, this plan is not all that's happening to protect us. To the new town comment, um, there's lots that's going on in the schools anyways to 
empower students to be upstanders, to know what's right and wrong. The core values in the schools are empowering the kids to speak up when they're uncomfortable, that um, teachers are being connected with students so that students feel more comfortable to ask a student, I'm sorry, so students feel more comfortable to ask a teacher or approach a teacher if they're not comfortable with something, whether or not it turns out to be something. So the process and those involved in this um, program have given me the confidence in what we need to do. I'm fully in support of it. Um, and I thank everybody that's been involved. Thank you. And I appreciate all the questions because I think they need to be asked. So thank you. Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill's Precinct 4. I certainly support the goals. I have real concerns about the lack of participation as far as the process, even in establishing specific goals. Once again, not proprietary. Uh, when I hear Homeland Security, it didn't give me a warm and fuzzy feeling because of the privacy issues. So I'd like to make a motion that the members of the select board be added to the committee because they are the body that is accountable to the entire community. They are elected by the community. And if they can't be trusted to keep, you know, as far as confidentiality, I think then we have a real problem. So that would be my motion, that the members of the select board, you know, our representatives thereof, be added to the, committee, the, the oversight committee. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay, discussion is now on adding the select board to the committee. Further discussion on that? Yes, Ms. Binda. One of the persons who, Angela Binda, Precinct 5, one of the persons who called me to ask me not to vote for this, one of the reasons was because there was no elected official on the board. So I, I would be in favor of that. Ms. Webb. Uh, Elaine Webb, Precinct 1, also school committee chair. Um, I, don't, um, I don't believe, I don't support this motion, but I would like to say that I don't see, if you're going to use the logic that the select board should be on there, then I do think you should, what you should be saying is that the school committee and the library trustees should be on there because there's, because we all have a vested interest. I think the process is in place to engage these elected boards and our finance committee through executive sessions, and I think that that is a good, solid process. I think that this is essential, and uh, we, we are being asked to take a leap of faith. I, I don't support this motion. I think it will not add to us getting accomplished what we need to accomplish to protect our students, to protect our staff, and protect ourselves when we go into our public buildings. So I don't support that motion. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ian Brown, Precinct 8. I support this motion because the, from the way I look at it, the more people that are involved in the decision making, right, especially trust people like the select board, the more democratic the decision is that gets made. Um, the less people that are involved, uh, the less I trust the decision. Because regardless of who those people were, if the decision is not able, the reasons and so forth are not able to be discussed in public, then it is whatever that group, however small, uh, is able to do. The larger the people, the more, the larger the group, the more morale and ideas we have in the room as to how that works. So I guess that's my point. But my question in regards to this is, do we think that the security footage could be used to, how am I going to word this, solve yeah. The uh, graffiti problem, which is but right now we're discussing the proposed amendment. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yep. That's all good. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. David Zeke, uh, Precinct One. I support this uh, this uh, uh, amendment. 
I am really distressed at the lack of community participation in this. I mean, I, I spent a lot of years in the defense business, you know, dealing with security issues, and, and there's, a, there's a, a sort of an environment, you know, that goes with that of, of, the, of a bunker mentality, and I can't tell where that ends and where serious concerns and, and serious issues with our, with our community start unless there's a lot of community involvement. I think uh, adding the uh, select board to this process is the least that we should do. Thank you. Mr. Lola, Chair. With all due respect, um, the suggestion is not within the four corners of the article, which is, which is simply debt authorization. That is a good point. I, let me just think about that for a second. Yes, I agree. That would, I have to uh, rule the uh, proposed amendment out of order. It is not within the scope of the article. Yes, Mr. Strubel. Thank you, Mr. Mudder, Jeff Strubel, Precincts. But in the, the light of uh, what has been suggested with that amendment, I'll just ask the question. Uh, are there or were there ever planned to be liaisons with the select board, the school committee, and the uh, library trustees on the safety committee so that they would, in fact, know what's going on and could, um, in executive session if need be, uh, re re relay the information to their boards? Mr. Lelisher. Um Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I really can't answer for the five members of the select board. I will tell you that there's one member that prefers not to have unique information and that it all be just public and one that would be interested. So it's a decision they have to make. Um, I will say right now there is already a subcommittee of two members that deal with capital projects and this would rightly belong to them right now if nothing else changes. Um, I would be much more comfortable having an executive session with the full boards, not just a subset of the boards, but that's just me speaking. Further discussion? Mr. Rock. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom O'Rourke, Precinct 2. I just want to go back to the earlier question about how do we evaluate the success of the, the project. And I, I would think that, just as a th one thought, you would be able to conduct another risk matrix assessment. So I'd, I'd hope that would be part of it. Um, before I forget, too, uh, Bob, I assume the person to your right is from TRC. Is that a correct assumption? Or no? Oh. Or somewhere? Oh, who is? I don't recognize it. Yeah. Oh. He'd like to be. No, that's, that's Joe Huggins, our facilities Oh, director. Joe, okay. Sorry, Joe. I never, I never met you. You'd... <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Uh, I, I just also wanted to go back to that community involvement piece. You know, I, I think the work the TRC does uh, is certainly going to be a very critical, but I think we all have a vested interest in the safety and security of our facilities and buildings, you know, and that starts with see something, say something, or suggestions, and uh, I think we all can impact it in a favorable way. And I, I just leave you with a thought. Some of you probably saw in the news a, a week or so ago the young girl who made a, a safety suggestion in town where there was a lot of accidents and she came up with a 3D uh, visual that uh, actually gave the impression that you were coming up to a speed bump and uh, that's been adopted and implemented. So we don't all have to be experts to, to help out. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Nick Boyvin, Precinct 7. Could we just refresh our collective recollection by backing up a few slides to that? There were some slides in the process, and I wanted to ask some questions about those. So there was a calendar, set of calendar slides, if I remember right. Of oh, the timeline? The timeline, thank you. So, so we could just these two slides, right? That Well, this was the first one, the second one. So I will say, first of all, I have to just state that I was a member of the school committee during some of these meetings, and I'm one of the people signed to these non-disclosure agreements, so obviously I can't um, go into any specifics, but I was present at some of these meetings. I'm wondering uh, um, either if the superintendent or the uh, town manager could just highlight uh, points of involvement with the elected boards during this process to date. Uh, I think that would be helpful. Um, I will also say just having been part of, of part of this process, I support um, the, the proposal uh, before us. Uh, I think it was a responsible and rigorous and thoughtful process. So for me, I support this. But I think it would be helpful to have a, uh, help everybody remember the interactions with the select board and the school committee and other boards. Thanks. Further discussion? It was a question. Oh, right? He had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, Go ahead. it's getting late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we've had um, 
there's been two executive sessions with all of the boards. Uh, one was in, uh, in 2016, I believe, or 2017, August 2017, and then one most recently in April. Um, in addition, we did have uh, a makeup session for board members that were not able to attend uh, the executive session in, um, uh, in April. Uh, we have also been giving uh, updates at the school committee meetings on all of the capital projects. Mrs. Dowd and Mr. Huggins have been given those, those updates, and obviously we can't go into specifics when we give those updates, but we are giving updates of all of the capital projects, including this, this one as well. Further discussion? Mr. Doxer. Mark Doctor, Precinct One, member of the uh, the Select Board. Just to clarify, and, and I think that this is an area where I'm feeling uncomfortable. I think some others may be feeling it as well. There has not been a lot of community process here, very much on purpose, and I understand some of it from the point of view of security. But I think where's the where is the line? And yes, there have been some executive sessions, and obviously we can't talk about things, but the details that can't be shared here can't be shared there either. So I don't want you to have the impression that they are. Thank you. Dr. Darney. There was, there was one other piece. Last May, um, we held a town and school security summit up in the uh, library where we went over, and I believe Mrs. Mercurio was there. Yes, you were. Um, where we went over all of the the, the different efforts that we have made in school security uh, and in, in town security over the last few years. And we talked about a lot of the things that we talk about, the drills that we do. We went over Alice. We went over the different protocols and procedures that we have, the collaboration that we have with police, fire, town, schools, um, and some of the things that we've done, the drills, the trainings, things like that. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very well attended security summit. Um, I believe we actually had more staff members there than we did community members. Um, but we have tried to talk about these things, the ones that we can talk about, we have talked about these, these processes in public. Ms. Alvarado, did you have a question? Did you? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I am torn. I fully and unequivocally support the implementation of building security. However, I have strongly disliked this process. Um, I object to the secrecy. I object to the lack of accountability. I object to fear as a reason to break good financial governance. And most importantly, I object to the decision of town staff to not include community input. Why is the answer simply no? A yes vote says that we approve of this process and the intentional omission of every elected person in this room from having a say on a $4 million investment. I move to table until Thursday. That motion is non-debatable. Is there a second? Second. second. We've uh, moved. Uh, all those in favor of laying this substance of this article on the table, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the chair is in doubt. Uh, I will ask my counters. All those in favor of tabling this motion, please rise. Sixteen. Sixteen. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Nineteen. Nineteen. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. And those opposed to laying this on the table? Oh. 
Oh, hold on before we do that. I'm going to ask those four again. What was the last number? We, we have 16, 19, 24. 25, 25. 25, okay. Okay, now all those. 17. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to have to do that again. We lost the, uh, the count here. All those in favor, please stay, please rise, and we'll count you again. Favor, yes. This is for the tabling only, yes. Is this in favor of? If you're in favor of putting this on the table, please rise. Oh, that again? I, the problem here is we lost the computer. We w are taking another count on the, those in favor of laying this on the table. So all those in favor of laying the substance of this article on the table, please rise. Until Thursday. Until Thursday. There's no, it's, it's on the table until it's taken off the table. Yeah. There is, there is, it, that, well, there is no such motion tabling to a time certain. It's tabling or it isn't. So you, the, the article is tabled until it's taken off the floor. So all those in favor of, um, you can the motion is to table, which puts it aside temporarily. It stays on the table until someone moves to take it off and it's voted to take it off. There is no time to that. It just happens when it happens. So right now we have a motion to lay this on the table. Presumably it would come up again Thursday, but that's, that would be another motion to take it off the table. So all those in favor of laying this on the table, please rise. 13. Do we have another question? I'm sorry. Yes. We don't have to adjourn on Thursday, what We would have to adjourn until Monday. The town meeting can adjourn to whenever it wants. So it could be Monday if we, if that's, or whatever town meeting decides. You may have to get the building. I don't know about that. There may be a, there may be a calendar issue, but it, it's up to town meeting to decide when it adjourns to. Another point of, what, what is your point? And, and, and we lost, and we lost the count. Point of order. Could the speaker please use the microphone? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As, as a point of order, the, the uh, vote collectors remember, I'm sure, the vote. Redoing the vote, I think, is, strikes me, where we might have a different result, doesn't seem proper. I think that the proper procedure should be that the vote counters are queried again for the totals that they gave you originally. Do Thank the you. vote counters remember all the totals? No. No. Okay, the only way to do this fairly, so, so, <laughs> so let me, let me start over here. We are now taking a vote on whether or not to lay this on the table. Please rise if you want to lay this on the table. Yeah. Yeah. 16. 16. I hope you heard that, everybody. <laughs> 25 all three times. 25. 18. 22. 22. 18. 18. And those opposed to laying this on the table? Three people left. <laughs> Three. Three. Nineteen. 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 The vote being 81 in the affirmative, 60 in the negative. This article is laid on the table. Mr. Moderator, Mr. motion no. to adjourn. Hold on. Mr. Meares. Tell me anytime.
Anda. Um, hello, uh, kindly don't leave just yet. Uh, there is a question as to whether my motion requires a two-thirds majority or a simple majority. Uh, so please bear with us while we deal with the technicalities. Okay, it has been confirmed that this article has been laid on the table by a vote of 81 to 60. It only requires a majority vote. Further business under this town meeting? We have a motion to adjourn until Thursday evening. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? This town meeting is adjourned until Thursday evening. Oh.